What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. Edith Eva Eager, are you familiar with her? Edith, what's her name? Edith Eva Eager. What's her story? I believe she's a Holocaust survivor. And her mom told her when they were going to the camps, her mom said to her, they can take everything from you, but they can't take your thoughts. And I think we, we often just live in the reality of our first thought, our first negative thought without thinking, can I change this? Is this really the truth? Or is, am I throwing a pity party for myself in this moment? Danny Miranda, welcome to New Jersey. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank it's, you for having this me. This is more your neck of the woods. Like, you're from New York. You're from up this way, but now you went to the faraway land of Austin, Texas. Yeah, Austin's great. It's the podcasting hub of America, it feels like. Is that just because Rogan's there? Probably. Yeah, but now a lot of people are there, right? You got Lex, you got yeah. Chris Williamson. There's a lot of up-and-coming creatives, and they're, the energy there is just it's special. How many people live in Austin? I want to say a million. See, that's sizable. It's not like a town. I mean, it's it's like a legit city. Yeah. And there's something special about when it's growing, too, and there's yeah. a lot of just youthful energy. Like, I go and I meet someone in Austin, I have a feeling that that person is building something for themselves. Mm. Whereas if I do the same thing in New York, they have an energy to them, but it's not the same to me. It's like somebody is is really like building something for someone else, usually. Interesting how you put that. At first, I was mishearing you, but I see what you're saying. Because, like, everyone thinks New York, it's like the hustle bustle energy capital of the world, but it's known for like Wall Street and stuff like that. Make money on this, make money on that. You're saying that with, I guess, more like in this case, usually the tech vibe, content vibe type thing in Austin, people are more looking for teamwork type things. Teamwork. And also, like, this is, I'm building this project for me. Whereas if you do it in New York, it's like, I'm building this project for a bank or I'm building this project mm. for... And so when you have people doing things for themselves, it's like a huge self-reliance and it it sparks a different type of person from my perspective. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely... And by the way, could you move just a little bit this way? Like Is it this that? thing? Yeah, yeah, roughly there. But, and you can yank that mic wherever you want as well. Yeah, and I you. forgot to tell you this earlier when we were on here, but... Whenever the headphone I thing goes it. out, just I do that, it. and that's it. It doesn't affect anything. Cool. But anyway, so, yeah, I mean, what – that place was building, it seems like, because it's not like I've been down there or anything, but talking to people, like my friend Jake Dun Dunlap went down there in, like, 2018. He was heavy in the tech space, and so he had been telling me and other people told me as well that it was building up, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016, but it seems like it just doubled basically, after the pandemic hit. No. Rogan effect. <laughs> there you go. Rogan effect, tech effect. It's, it's multiple things, I think. But, I mean, is that like the real, like, is it down there? Is everyone like, Rogan's here, I'm here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, probably inadvertently, right? Because I didn't yeah. move there for Joe Rogan, but I moved there because of podcasting and because every time I visited there, I was like, oh my God, there's another batch of people that I want to talk to. And it's like, that happens enough times, then you're like, all right, I might as well just stay. Yeah. So. Leave New York for the for the brighter brighter undercurrent down there. I Big like Austin that. energy, baby. Big Austin. <laughs> are, are you down there permanently, you think? I think so. I, I wouldn't say permanently, and I can't see myself past a year being uh, 27 and going to turn 28 in a month. But, I mean, it's just, it's the most at home I've ever felt in my entire life. That's awesome, man. I mean, that's, that's especially like in your 20s, trying to find, you know, we're all trying to find our way and everything, you know, to, to feel like you're in the right community, in the right space. Sounds like you're surrounded by the right people just by even just listening to your podcast. Like, that's, that's, that's awesome. But yeah, I mean, not to bury the lead, you got the Danny Miranda podcast. I had heard about this, I think when you interviewed Pomp, Back, what was that, like a year ago, maybe? Something like that? August 2022, I feel. Yeah, it's almost a year ago. 
but I, I had heard about you then. I started following you, and I just really, you know, I, I respect people in anything who work hard. I understand people, obviously, in content who work hard, and I really understand people in podcasts who work hard because I know, you know, what goes into it. And, and, you know, you're putting out like three episodes a week. You're talking to serious people. I'd highly recommend your podcast to people not who haven't heard of it before. It's on YouTube and Spotify and everywhere. But, you know, what, what made you... What made you want to do this? Just because your podcast seems to focus on a lot of people who are have built things or are building things, and it's focused a lot on like their mindset and how they went about doing what they did or what they're in the midst of doing. Like, was was that for you to try to want to build something on your own, or were you just inherently curious about it? Yeah. So the podcast started because in July of 2020 i put out on twitter who wants to talk on the phone and i would have these amazing phone conversations with random strangers around the world and people were really affected by it people were like wow like i feel different after this phone call and i was like i feel different this is amazing like i got a new perspective on the world and because it started from that place i was like i gotta keep doing this and Mm. also i gotta record these so that one i can listen to them later two that somebody else somewhere could potentially benefit from it. And so I just started doing these phone calls, man. And the phone calls led to incredible, incredible things where it's like by the 39th episode of the podcast, Gary Vaynerchuk came on it. And mm. and I'm like, wow, like this is just something that was an idea in my head that started with phone calls six months ago. And now this is like a, a thing that one of my heroes has come on. Like to me, that was the craziest thing and it really made me be like oh wow like there's something here that's like a wink from the universe and i gotta keep doing this thing what were you doing for a living before that so i was building drop shipping stores graduate college and i'm like i don't want to work for anyone anytime in my mm-hmm. life and so i started thinking about what are the ways in which i can make money on my own and that was doing e-commerce and drop shipping within like six months i got really good at it uh, made a bunch of money, but I was like, "This." Well, it was after a year and a half where I was, yeah. What 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 goes into that though? Like when people say drop, I mean, I know what drop shipping yeah. is, but like, what were you? Take me through a day. Like, what were you doing? It was a lot of Facebook ads. Like, mm. let me create ads around products. And so at the time, I was selling uh, like bracelets and like custom anniversary bracelets. So basically, someone place an order for a specific date for a keychain and I would ship it off and have somebody ship it off. And I was just the middleman making that transaction happen. And, you know, a part of me was like, what the hell am I doing? You know, like this is not, it it took a while for me to get to that point about a year and a half, but I was just like, this is not fulfilling in any way to me. This is not like the depths of my soul aren't being, and you probably related to this being on wall street, but it's just like, to me, it was very, it was very like anyone could do this. It wasn't creative at all. And because it felt that way, I didn't I wouldn't call it not creative at the time, but to me that just felt like soul eating. Mm. And because of that, I was just like, I, I can't do this. I, I just had enough. After like I wanna say it was probably a year or two where I was just like, I can't do this anymore. But you were making pretty good money. Yes. But you know, similar to you, very similar story. Now that I think about it, it's just like, it's not about the money. It's about like, am I excited to wake up every day? Well, what, I mean, what was that? It's not like you're, you're working for yourself, right? At least you're not doing like a nine to five or something under the bright lights, doing some bullshit for someone else and, and stuff. But like, what, did you have trouble like waking up in the morning to do it? Yes. Mm. You know, like when it was easy work that I was doing, I would procrastinate and watch Joe Rogan. And <laughs> <laughs> it's like, looking back on it, it's so obvious that that pointed to something. Mm. And I think if you're in a position in your life where you're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing right now, like, look where you're procrastinating. Like, that, to me, is the best sign to figure out what it is you, quote unquote, should be doing. Uh, so because you liked like the podcast doing it you thought like oh i could i could do something my own way like that no it, it wasn't it wasn't about rogan and seeing rogan and doing a podcast because rogan did a podcast and every part of me resented that like i'm gonna do something because someone else 
did it that I like, like mm. it has to come about organically. And it wasn't until I look back on it, you know, several years later where I'm like, oh, I was procrastinating. And the what I was doing by procrastinating was watching something that I was trying to emulate in some way. Mm. Uh, so it wasn't it wasn't like I, I looked at that and said I'm gonna I wasn't smart enough to realize that. But I think looking for people in the future of like, what am I supposed to be doing? I'm listening to a podcast right now. What like if there's somebody in that position, my suggestion to them is like, check out what you're you're doing when you're quote unquote not on the clock or not doing anything. Cause that's the time when you procrastinate, that's you doing things for yourself. Yes. And so it's it's important to note that if you want to live a life full of your own passion and your own pursuits. But was were were there perfect or perfect were there certain subjects I mean I would assume it was this way based on what your podcast is now, but were there certain things that you really gravitated towards, like, you know, certain podcasts, maybe even of Joe Rogan that you would listen to over others that you were like, Oh my God, when you were evaluating, you're like, Wow, I'm really into that. I'd love to talk with that guy right there. Yeah. So I've always been into psychology and I've always been into business. Mm. Like since I could read, I had books from Ryan Holiday and books from Tim Ferriss. Like these were just early influences in me. I don't know why I was drawn to them per se, but like I remember going through Malcolm Gladwell books and like people now it's like cool to shit on Malcolm Gladwell books and like Is it? I don't know. Why? I, I've seen that go around on Twitter, but like I love those books. No, they're amazing. Yeah, Fuck that <laughs> and I'm I'm with you. And yeah. so, like I remember reading those, like Blink and Tipping Point, and I just remember being like, "This is what I love." Like if I could talk to Malcolm Gladwell, like that would be the craziest thing ever. Mm. And so, I think because I was a big reader, because I was interested in psychology and how the mind works, it was those influences that made me want to go down the rabbit hole of entrepreneurship and psychology and and really figuring out how do humans think and why do they think and what makes them happy and what makes them sad so yeah yeah you do you've done some great podcasts with guys where i really feel like i understand who they are as a person you know even if you didn't even if you had seen what they had done in business or in success or in content or whatever you kind of you do a really good job of getting like the lens on like well what makes this guy tick and you did one recently with a guy whose life has kind of been about that, what he's known for. The guy, what's his name? Robert Green, is that it? Robert the Green. 48 yeah. Laws of Power yeah. guy. That guy always looks like he just finished the wildest bender and doesn't think anyone can know. It's hilarious. But he's this unbelievably like laid back, but confidently speaking guy, which is kind of apropos for what, what he writes about. But, you know, I I found myself when I was listening to that, naturally hearing and you and I talked about this on the podcast you and I just recorded together for your podcast but naturally hearing how genuinely curious you were about how he arrived at not writing the 48 laws of power but how he arrived like interested in in the type of subject who could who could get like that could get him there when you were first starting this though was that like something that came naturally or was it more like you were just interested in what these people talked about and eventually you figured out like, oh, wait, there's a layer before they even go to do anything. Yeah. So for me, the curiosity stemmed from meditating and mm. going inward. I was never a curious person all my life. Which, really? Which surprises the hell out of people. I first became curious when I started looking at my own mind, when I started going inward and started to be like, wow, I think this wow, I, I think this about this, like, what do other people think? What's going on around with the world around me? Mm. And so it was that early meditation. So starting September 2019, I started meditating 20 minutes in the morning. And doing that... What does that consist of? When literally, say, what does that mean? It means taking a timer, okay, putting it on 20 minutes, and just sitting there with the thoughts. Whatever they are, just seeing them, embodying them, being with them, ignoring them. It's all whatever you do for 20 minutes with just nothingness and that timer, click it and then go. Is it a physical timer or a phone timer? Physical timer. Very important. Mm. It's like a kitchen timer so that you don't use your phone and you don't scroll before and after. And, mm. and so this was a practice that I did for 90 days and I'm sitting there on the 90th day and I'm like, oh, that didn't work. Like meditating, whatever, like it's dumb. I stop at a red light and I'm sitting there at that red light 
And I'm like, oh, I want this light to be green. Like, why well, won't this light be green? Like, let's go, let's go. And I catch myself and I start laughing. I'm like, oh my God, every time that I've been at a red light, I've thought this before. I've wanted it to be green. Oh my God, this is crazy. And then I, mm. when I recognized it, I could then change it. And when I could change it, I had a better experience on this floating rock in space. And so what I realized was that meditation gave me the ability to, in the moment, look at my thought and be like, do I want this or do I want that? Mm. And that's a crazy powerful skill that for 24, 25 years of my life, I did not have. What made you do that again? I, I, I can't remember if you said that right I at the didn't. beginning. So my friend Tej Dosa, he was somebody who I was following on Twitter and I would look at him and be like, this guy's tweeting differently. Like it's with more love. It's with more empathy. It's what, with What's his story? He's a copywriter and okay. he's an entrepreneur, but he he wasn't tweeting in the way that most copywriters and entrepreneurs were. It was with something else. There was a, a feeling of love infused in his tweets. Mm. That's what I realized. But I didn't I didn't connect that at the moment. I was just like, like I have a friend, Tej. He's amazing. I want to be a little bit more like Tej. He recommends doing meditation. Okay, I'll try it out. And so that's the origin story for the meditation. So you, that wasn't something that you ever even knew a damn thing about before that. No. And I, I would yeah, always look at it and so be like, like nah, that's not, that's not something I could do. That doesn't work. That's silly. And eh, it's crazy, man. Like, I, I can't talk about it enough. Like, it is the, most impo- the single most important thing I've ever done in my life. What happens when, so when you were first starting it, I would imagine you're not good at it. You know, you're thinking about things, you're not clearing your head, but like, what is, like when people talk about meditation with nothingness, like what, what happens to you? I've never really done a ton of it. I've I've tried it before. Like I've done it, but I don't feel like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't feel like I've really done it. Like, how do you, how do you just like that timer starts and you just turn off? No, I I'm like everyone else. I don't just turn off. Mm. I go through the list of things that I'm thinking about that day Mm. or that I, I did the day before that I wish I could have done differently. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting that my brain goes to that. I'm just getting closer in touch with myself. And yeah, I'm not, it, being good at meditation is like kind of a misnomer, just like watching my own thoughts. And it's like, yeah, you can get better at it because you are less identifying with those thoughts. But dude, I mean, it's like you, people need to give themselves grace, you know, when they start mm. something. 90 days, like you go to the gym for 90 days, you start running for 90 yeah. days. Like, it's like, you're not going to be quote unquote good at it. You're going to be very identified with the things that come in your head. And it's only through years and years of practice that you get better at it. But it was after 90 days that I noticed I could make a difference. And that was 90 days of doing it every single morning, first thing in the morning. Was there a moment though, where you're like, oh, sh- I'm totally lost right now. Like, I'm lost in, in the translation of this. It's, like, happening. What Was, do you mean? Like, did you have a cross? Because, again, I'd imagine, like, at the beginning, you're like, all right, I'm trying to learn how to do this, right? You're feeling, yeah. like you said, there was a 90-day period, and you said when that ended, like, you kind of felt it. But was there, like, you know, on day 82, you're like, oh, wait, it's working. <laughs> like, it's ha- like maybe it was after the fact, not while you're in it. But did you have one of those? No, I think it was, like, day 90. like Literally when I, day Yeah, 90. when... when and I'm, but I'm sure that I was feeling the effects of it in the first month of it. Like after 21 days, I'm sure I was feeling differently. After 45, I'm sure differently. But like it was the 90th day that really like hit it home of this is something that you're going to be doing for the rest of your life because that made a huge impact on your well-being in that moment. And so, yeah, I think it's it's crazy to me that like people go on the internet and haven't meditated that day. Like, <laughs> well, it's crazy to me because there's so much coming at you and there's so many thoughts that are not your own that are now being placed into your brain and you start getting confused. Which is my thought? Which is the one that came from that person? Mm. Which is, and it's like, dude, how do you? And so what I noticed was when I started meditating, the things that I was doing in my day to day were more me. I started to, like, I was going to become a personal trainer and I noticed, oh my God, like, being a personal trainer is way more me than what I was doing previously, which was mm. drop shipping, right? And then I noticed that as I like meditated more deeply, like then after six months, I started doing 60 minute meditations and 60 minutes. 60 minutes straight. And like people are like, that's crazy. I'm like, you can't spend 60 minutes with yourself. Like you spend hours and hours and hours with other people every single day. 
you you should give yourself at least the same gift that you're giving to other people. Your attention is a gift. And so if you point your mm. attention inward, that that creates a, an entirely different reality. And that be, that reality becomes way more you than the reality of what other people think you should be thinking about. That's pretty deep. It's really fucking important. Yeah. It's really important. And I don't think in a world where people are willing to look at other people so much and the things that we value are how many people can look at this thing, but have you even looked at yourself? Bro, I mean, it is the most important thing. And so, you know, before I, I got here today, 20 minutes in the morning, before I went to sleep last night, 20 minutes before I oh, went so to bed. you're doing it twice a lot now. I, I mean, I'm doing it twice. I'm doing it whenever. It's like, this thing is just like, you're giving yourself the gift that you're giving me right now by paying attention to me, right? Like, this feels great. It feels great when you can give somebody else the gift of your attention. So like, why not give that to yourself? Why not? What, I mean, you gave the example of like complaining at the lights and not getting self-aware of what were your thoughts versus what are other things kind of placed upon you. But what, if you don't mind sharing, if you do, don't. But what, what types of things, uncomfortable things, did you uncover once you got good at meditating and really got in touch with yourself? Yeah, great question. So... It was, I started doing 60 minutes in May of 2020. And on the, I want to say, but in the first two weeks of doing 60 minute meditations, I realized, oh, wow, this is way different than 20 minute meditations. The reason being, there's a lot of stuff that comes out in the 20 to 60 minute mark that you're, are what you really think. And the deep places of your mind that you won't go because it takes out your conscious mind in a way. And so one of the situations that I noted that changed my life forever and that made me laugh in that moment was that eight years prior, a kid had shoved me into a locker senior year of high school. And I was holding on to that situation mm. for eight years. And I, f I remember that situation feeling so emasculated, feeling like it was the situation, I was 140 pounds soaking wet, and that situation made me start going to the gym and made me start taking my physical self more seriously and made me feel like, damn, like I wanna be able to create some change in yeah. the world. And like, I can't do that if I'm getting beat up at school, basically. Why'd he shove you in a locker? Oh, it's a long story. <laughs> we got time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, basically what happened was, there, the entire school, uh, there was like a, a Twitter account for the school that was like a, an anonymous account. Oh, yeah. That was shitting on different people in a funny way. And everyone in the school thought that it was me, fully convinced. And I knew that it wasn't myself because I wasn't tweeting from it, but I had to prove that it wasn't me. How do you prove that it's not you? You have to prove it's someone else. And so I went through a spreadsheet and had a spreadsheet of every time that person tweeted. And then I had a, a, a spreadsheet of <laughs> what they were tweeting about. And I was like, oh, wow, like, I know it's this guy. And I told everyone that it was this person. And this person obviously got upset that it was me, that I was the one telling everyone that, because if it's oh, not you, yeah. if it's not you and, and someone accuses you, you're like, that's yeah, stupid. Yeah, yeah. But if it's not, if it's you and someone accuses you of it, you get upset. Yes. And so... He got upset. He pushed me into a locker and it really stayed with me. And it really like, like I was holding on to it. But then I'm in the meditation and I'm like, oh my God, I had such anger for this kid, such anger for myself. And then I was able to forgive him eight years later mm. by being able to say like, it's all good. Like that happened. And it's all good that that led you to do this like it all it's all good that it, le it led you to start lifting weights and it's all good that it caused you anger and like you that, you used it for good and i used it for good yeah for a lot of good I yeah guess. and and having the forgiveness of that to that kid and to myself and just like saying it in my head like i forgive you man like it's all good and saying it to myself that cleared so much that what came next in my life was the podcast and what mm -hmm. came next was it was just like the, having that energy I think they're, we're holding on to things all the time yes. from people and situations and we haven't looked at them or 
asked ourselves, why is that there? We don't even think about it. We repress it. And it's causing us a lot of anger. And looking at it gave me the freedom to be like, holy shit, that has no effect on me. And there's a lot of things in my life that have been insecurities or things that I'm upset at myself for that I've let go because I've just looked at it and been like, that has no power over me. Like, I don't Was care. it that easy though the first time? Like when you crossed that maybe with the locker situation, just be like, wait, I don't care about that. I yeah. can move on. I'll forgive him. Or was it more like a process? Like you got to meditate 25 times before you really start to so, act like, oh, okay, all right, I can get there. Yeah. So to be fair, that was nine months, right? When I did that 60 minute meditation in the first week of it, that was nine months of me meditating for 20 sure. minutes. So yeah, all that time that I was doing was building up to that moment. But once it happened, it was an instant release. Once I, as soon as I, I thought of it and I laughed at myself that it was still in my head because I'm like, I've been carrying that around? Like, holy shit. Like, and I think that if we can just get comfortable, like with the things that are in our head that's taking up space, we live a lot more free life. And as a result, we become a lot more happy. I think you're, I think you and other smart people I've heard say a very similar thing are more than on to something there. I, I just, I don't know. I try to keep it honest with myself all the time at things I carry. I'm definitely not perfect at keeping myself honest. But one thing I do believe is that if you hold on to, I'll even put a term on, if you hold on to grudges and you really hold on to them for years, it, it has a way worse effect on you than the other person you're not yeah, i mean they're not getting shit they're just going about their life they may not even know you're holding it right but i think it's a very human thing to have them at first you know for me i i will and i've really meditation is something that i need to try again like actually do it because like i said i've never really done it like i say like i've tried to do it but like what does that mean really try it means not anything along the lines of what you're saying no kitchen timer no fucking i'm gonna do it at 9 a.m on this day yeah. every day or like no real commitment so as far as i'm concerned you're not you're kind of one foot in one foot out so who knows if you could really even get the benefits of it but you know looking at my life outside of that that i could probably unpack a lot better doing meditation it's like you know i think my ability to eventually let things go and maybe use them in the short term before I let them go for good is something that gives me more peace. You know, I worry, like I, I, I hear a lot of stories like the one you just said, like I held on to that one thing. And it's like, I'd love to know if there's something in there I'm missing that I'm hanging on to if, if I could find that because that would be amazing to get rid of it if I'm not recognizing it right now because I know how good it feels naturally without even doing the meditation you know to be able to be like oh i hated this bitch for like two years but i got good stuff out of that i wish her so much so much good now you know what i mean like you just kind of let it go but meditation forces you it seems like to get in touch with all of it yeah well for me it was the 20 to 60 minute mark like going from 20 minutes to 60 minutes that made me sit with it because you can lie to yourself for 20 minutes it's a lot harder to, now it's not necessarily lie, right? Like it's easy to look at the things that are at the surface level for 20 minutes. It's a lot harder to sit there after 30, 40 minutes and be like, oh shit, what happened in 12th grade? Like what happened? Like what really happened? Like you're going to go to that place and then you're going to ask yourself, why am I thinking of that? Why the hell am I, th th this happened eight years ago. So, so I think like, and you're, you're so right. When you are without the grudges, you just want people to be at peace and you want yourself to be at peace and you want to look for the good in the world because you're not burdened by the things. And the thing is also, this is generational. Like this gets passed down. Oh yeah. Like, oh, yeah. The, like what you think and how you act and how you behave, that is what your parents, what they deal with. How much, you know, drama or stress or like that all plays a part in it as well. It's your think, environment. No? Yeah. Absolutely. Because if, if you go into the, the childhood of somebody in a different place, you're going to think everything that someone's doing is crazy because it's just a different reality. And even though we're both human, it, it's just the, the manifestation of that. And, you know, I think that everything that I've done with the podcast, like that is just from meditation, every single thing. And, and that's the crazy thing. It's like, 
I've built something great that I think is great that, you know, people like could say they've enjoyed it, but it's all from meditation. Meditation gave every single episode. It gave me the discipline. It gave me the ability to sit with silence. Like that's a very important thing as a podcaster. Like everything that the podcast has built is from meditation. I'm just thinking about that like, and quantifying that in my head because I know how much like your style, you go about this a different way than I do. And I, I love that when I encounter different people, they use a different part of their brain to accomplish the same thing. But like you put a lot of work in for the show. It's not you don't just like sit down with these people and whatever, like and you're doing three a week, but you're very prepared. You, as I already said, like you're genuinely curious, but you you know everything about the people you sit with. But it doesn't – You're. it sounds like I guess you're saying the baseline of the ability to do all that is coming from meditation. It's not like you're doing all that while you're meditating. Correct. Right. What okay. you realize is that the meditation becomes outside of the meditation. You realize that everything is happening perfectly just the way it is. Similar to you were talking about on, on my show, you were like, yeah, sometimes I'll just have a clip and it'll be the perfect amount of time and it'll be like, how yeah. is that the right thing at the right time? Like there's something universal about that. And my question to you is like, what if life is like that? What yeah. if your life is like that? Yeah. What if my life is like that? And if you really think about it, 13.8 billion years got us to this moment right now. What the hell? Well, you're telling me that this moment isn't perfect? You're telling me that it could be any other way? It can't. So just be here right now because 13.8 billion years got us to right now. <laughs> like that is just a crazy concept. If people really stood there and sat there and and witnessed what that meant like what does that mean for 13.8 billion years to get to this moment i hope people can see the veins in your neck popping while you're saying i'm getting turned like i'm, I'm turned up listen to this. this is fucking awesome like you're like you're like all about this shit but like when you go to do it it's just funny like because you're talking about this so passionately and yet we're talking about an act where you're doing the opposite you're getting quiet mm -hmm. and you're getting silent you're getting serene you're getting calm but like you you kind of wake up the beast when you do it that's the great paradox of it well the funny thing is the people who listen the most also like talking the most why because they've heard like you're you're a great listener but you also love talking as well and the reason for that is because you're ingesting so much. You're ingesting so much knowledge. You're ingesting so mm, much. And mm. so I feel the same way when I'm meditating. It's like I'm ingesting the universe. I'm ingesting myself. I'm really thinking about like who am I and what's going on and, and also just like mundane shit. And then it's like I want to talk about that. I want to like tell you guys like you got to pay attention to yourself as well. And it's like you had, uh, you had James Fox in here who was talking about – I mentioned this on my episode with you because it was so impactful when James Fox says that he interviewed a doctor who said that an alien spoke to him and said, you humans don't know your potential. Akio. Ki. Akio. 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 A cerca da casa era aquela. Foi aqui que caiu. Se eles morreram aqui. Like I feel so bad for you. You don't know your potential. Is what the alien said to the doctor. And I swear to you, I feel the exact same way when I'm meditating. It's like, mm. you don't know your potential. You don't know what, and like, you're here to realize it. And I think like greater levels of awareness meditation gives you, which allow you to access more of your potential. I'm here talking about how the podcast has made me more me because of meditating. It's like, that's me tapping into something greater. And I'm like, holy shit, like, this is, <laughs> this is crazy. Do you ever feel like you're like completely out of your body when you're doing it? All like, do you feel like you're floating above yourself? No, no. So I feel like a lot of times I'm I'm in my body, and I'll, what's interesting is that a lot of times I'll I'll notice a lot of energy in my head, and then th this one really crazy situation happened where I some guy hit me up on on Twitter and was like, "Yo, I'm dealing with some real bad situation." So I was like, "Yo, call me," and so. He gave me his number and 
I called him on the spot and I helped him out for 45 minutes explaining to him the ways in which he was, his parents had led to trauma for him and gave him a new perspective on his life. I did that, right? And then right after that, I meditated for, for an hour. And what I felt was not my head. I felt my heart. Mm. All the energy that usually comes from my head was coming from my heart. And I was like, that's a fascinating thing. If you can help somebody, it literally can change where the energy in your body comes from. What do you, when you say energy, can you describe that feeling for me? Yeah. Like you, when you say I felt energy in my head or I felt energy in my heart, is yeah. it like literally like a blood flow type feeling? Like, what do you mean? You know, like how all the thoughts like come from the head, like, yes. or you feel that sometimes yeah. like the, the thoughts are coming from the head. If you just sit there with it, thoughts will come yes. from the head. Yes. Right. Imagine all those thoughts coming from the heart instead. Like not just like thinking that, but like mm. actually feeling it. Imagine if all those thoughts that used to be coming from the head came from the heart. That's how it felt. I know exactly what you're saying. And yeah. and it was directly related to helping this guy out. And it stayed the next day too. It was crazy. I'm like, wow, like really helping somebody at a deep level can have that impact? Like shit was wild to me. See, you, a lot of people help you and me by coming in here to talk with us, right? It's fair to say, like they're... I wouldn't have a show without guests. You wouldn't have a show without guests. It's a beautiful thing. But speaking from the perspective of your show, you help a lot of people too because you're so, again, you have a similar theme across a lot of episodes that helps, but you're so intentional with how getting them to open up is like you're getting them to meditate. You're getting them to, yeah, in, in a lot of ways. And I, I felt that when when I was sitting across from you and you were asking me some questions. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about some things I haven't really thought about before. That's why I'm so, that's why we're digging into this topic right now so much on this podcast. But, you know, in doing that, there's a gratifying feeling about that or more serious things you may do for people. Maybe that guy you called up was going to be suicidal or something and, and you doing that and taking time out of your day to, to reset his head and, and make him feel heard might have changed his life. Could be something like that. Might not be. But either way, it was a nice thing. The, the great the most interesting thing to me about doing nice things for other people when I look at people who don't do that is that not to be selfish about it, but when you do good things for other people, you are <laughs> you're really doing a lot of it also for yourself because you feel fucking great doing it. I feel amazing. When I, when I take time out of my day and help someone out with something they never expected, I know – like it's awesome they get a lot out of that and i'm glad because that that was the objective right but i also you know maybe i get off the phone like you and i'm also like god damn all right that was a good thing nice job like that's the karma that you know what i mean like the like do you believe in karma in the universe absolutely yeah i mean the gift when you receive a gift the same centers in your brain light up as when you receive one when you give and oh, when yeah, you yeah, receive yeah. so it's the same same thing that comes to your mind when you give and receive gifts do you like getting gifts? Yeah, I don't mind it. But mm, see, all right, so you and I are similar like that. Like I, I don't, I, I'm very appreciative, but like I'm not. Yeah, I don't like light. I could tell you don't like light up about it, but you light about up about giving them. Well, here's the thing: the reason why I don't light up about receiving them is because one is in your control and one's not. Mm. It's always in your control to give, but it's not always in your control to receive. Mm. And so. I like things where I'm in control, right? We create this podcast. We're in control in, in a lot of sense of how it's being done, what's going on, who the guests are that are coming on, how we're asking questions. We're in control. So, and it's, I feel it's better to be in control because you can actually do it more often. And if you can do it more often, you can feel happier more often. So I love getting gifts. I'm not downplaying that, but I love giving more because I can control it. Yeah, that's that's fascinating how you put that. I don't think it's bad to be like there's being a control freak and letting that affect other people in your life. But when it comes to like the core things in your life, be it what you have to do every day to make a living, your happiness, as long as it's not at the expense of other people, obviously, you know, the happiness of people around you, too. There's a level of control you want to have to that where it gets a little sticky is when you're bringing in the other people. So maybe the last example there, like the happiness of the people around you. You may not know how to make them happy 
as well as they do. They may not even be able to express what makes them happy. But you can run into, you can kind of get tripped up sometimes if you're someone like you or like me who likes to have control of our day. You can get tripped up and then trying to do the right thing and doing it the wrong way for other people. So I don't know if you're like ever in touch with asking yourself, not necessarily in meditation, but just like asking yourself in general, if you are doing things because you're trying to control them for the good or you're doing things because it's just your natural behavior to try to control the situation so that you know what's going on. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not really. Okay. That's, this is a tough one to explain, but I just love how you got me thinking on that. So you see the detail I put in my podcast, yeah. right? We've talked about that. I have intense control over every frame. You can ask Alessi Alaman and Akshat who do edits for me about how I am in the editing process. I'm actively involved in every fucking frame and they think it's hilarious, right? Yeah. It's my product. You know what I mean? And to their credit, they give a shit about it and they do an amazing job and you need people who are receptive of that. If I acted like that, like I know when I'm when I'm doing that, it's my product, so I'm doing this for a good thing because we're trying to make this right. I know in my head what I'm visualizing. Hopefully people, the marketplace is going to like it, but this is what we're going to try to do. But if I then drag that into the rest of my life and somebody I love I'm trying to control everything they do, which I don't, I do a good job of not doing this, but like, I have to always be in touch with it. Like, oh, am I trying to help them because I think I know the best way or am I trying to help them because this is just, this is, this is actually something that's going to benefit them. This is the way it needs to be done. So do you ever find yourself getting caught between those worlds of like, wait a minute, this is not my decision to have here. This is not my thing to dip my hands into, but that's like how I operate every day. So I need to pull back. Yeah, you're talking about, is it coming from the ego or is it coming from the soul? And Oh, I never, that's good. Do you want to be right or do you want to do what's right for the world, yeah. so to speak? Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And so I, I'm very good. Meditation has helped me, be, helped me understand where I'm coming from ego and where I'm coming from soul. So I think when you're forced to sit down with yourself and really look at yourself every day, that is, uh, it's a helpful way to keep yourself in check. Yeah, that's ego versus soul. Yeah. I could have just saved like three minutes there if I had <laughs> I'd known that one. Did you come up with that yourself? So that comes in some part from my friend. It feels like a friend. Peter Crone is this guy that I've been watching for the past month. And I've I've dug into his stuff so much. I hope you can get him on the podcast here one day. Who is he? He's the mental coach for... He calls himself the mind architect. He's the mental coach for, I believe... Paul Goldschmidt of the Diamondbacks NL MVP and mm. just an absolute legend. This guy? Peter Crone. Yeah, that's him. Okay. He he has spent more time helping people understand their own psychology and get to a place of peace than I believe any person who has ever lived, potentially. Like he <laughs> It's a big compliment, right? Dude, there. I mean, the level of peace I feel from just hearing this man talk is insane what does he do like what is it what's I, like his thing i've spent the last month trying to break down exactly what he's doing why he's doing it, and how he's doing it and i still don't know hmm. so i mean what he's doing is he's figuring out where you're blocked based on how you speak and your energy and then is helping you not he's not telling you to get there he's helping you show yourself where you're living in that prison the prison being like i'm not enough I'm not good enough. Um, I'm I I don't belong. So he he highlights that for people so that they could see it themselves by asking them questions, and he helps them release that reality so that they can live in more freedom. Mm. But he points out often that you know people are are coming from they they'd rather live in the prison that they've created than a new reality that is potentially bigger, and. That's a tough thing to realize. And his his distinction of ego versus soul really, really helped me out. Yeah, that, I, I, you know, I think a lot of people go through their lives, and I don't know, I've only ever lived in my head, but it appears that a lot of people go through their lives never, forget meditation, never getting in touch with the fact that they have put barriers, and if you want to call it like a prison in that way around what their capabilities are, what 
the ceiling of their happiness is if they have a ceiling on it you know that's not necessarily a great thing if you have that but in a lot of ways what you do like you're talking about this guy you become a fan of part of what's leading you to him is probably the people you talked with a lot of people you talked with the types of things that you're therefore curious about because of your job and what you do and now you get these perspectives because you're out there you know you're looking for it and yeah. sometimes like I'm grateful for bumping into the things that I was never looking for. That's a beautiful thing. And that's that's great. But sometimes when you're like, you know, when you're in the right, you're in the right lane and you just kind of keep, not the right lane, but like the correct lane, I should say. Yeah. And you, you just keep on picking up tidbits because you know you're driving on the right road here. Like it seems like you're very much, you've been in that zone now. Like at least I've been following you for like a year. It seems like you've. You've never wavered. Like you're very consistently happy on on the path you're on. Dude, I've been in that lane since I was 13 years old. There's a blog out there that I wrote on time management telling people how to be happier. And I was 13 mm. years old. When you say like the podcast has helped me like come to Peter Crone, I think that's true in some sense. But I also think like it's destiny in a way. Like what 13 year old is writing about happiness for generations at 13 years old? Like that doesn't happen. And so this is a manifestation of, like, I feel like my soul's purpose. What made you want to write about happiness at I 13? have no idea. I have no clue. I was writing about Gary Vaynerchuk and how people can be happier. When you were 13? Yes. Gary Vee was around then? 2009, I was watching his wine library TV show. Really? I was probably the only 13-year-old on the planet doing that. So you were on that guy before anybody? Yes. Wow. And so when- You're watching a wine TV show. You're 13. That's how I got him on the podcast was because I tweeted out the blog post of me writing about Gary Vee in 2009. And he followed me from that. When he followed me, I tweeted out that he followed me. After he followed me, the people in the comments saying, yo, you got to go on this guy's podcast. So this shit's in me, in me, in me at a deep level. Wow. And so I think I was just born with this. And if you're born with it, like, this is just a, a manifestation of how to get better at that skill. Helping people understand who they are and release them from the, the blockages that they've been living in. Like, that's what I was trying to do at 13. That's what I'm trying to do with the podcast. That's what Peter Crone does so very well. And I'm just trying to live that out to the best of my abilities. Because I want people to be more free, to be happier, to feel the way that I feel. I wish everyone felt that way. Mm -hmm. And if they did the world would be a lighter place, like lighter from an energy perspective. And man, oh man, like I will do everything in my power for however many years I've been, I am given to do that. And I feel like very much like this is a mission that was sent to me in this body of mind before I could even, like truly, yeah. like I feel like I was placed with this, this, uh, this responsibility. Do you have people like in your family or friends that you grew up around who have a similar... My, outlook on things my grandpa did everything successful in life but has no he he does zero interest in teaching other people he has zero interest in breaking it down the psychology of what he did or how he did it successfully hmm. my parents like my, my mom is like a therapist and that's like the closest mm. similarity well that's interesting yeah but she's a lawyer by trade but she's a therapist like she'll be a therapist to me she'll like listen to my problems and explain how i could do things differently in a non-judgmental mm. way so yeah that's where it comes from i guess but it's not like uh it's not like she has any desires to like help people at a grand scale like that you know but there's some sort of baseline there clearly yeah because you felt it sounds like if she was good at what you just said she listened to understand you mm -hmm. and that's how you listen to other people right it's like my dad didn't do a podcast but he's a lawyer yeah. you know what i mean so he's good at that he can do and my mom's good at that too so maybe that's where it comes from they didn't even know what a podcast was you know they they don't know they don't see content lines like on online they just you know some pops up they watch it you know they're not thinking about that like you and i are but they can have like that, that I always just look for that baseline. That's all it is. It's not like someone needs to be doing the same thing or thinking the same type of way or saying the same types of things. But is there like some sort of like spark there that you can point to and be like, ooh, that's where it maybe started. And it sounds like you had that. Yeah. It's interesting from the, the lawyer to the podcaster 
child because it's, <laughs> because it's a very interesting similarity. What do you have to do when you're a lawyer? You have to read through a bunch of stuff, talk to a bunch of people, figure out how to present your side the best. What do you do when you're a podcaster? You read through a bunch of stuff, you listen to a bunch of stuff, and then you ask questions to try to help somebody somewhere understand the world better. Yeah. And it's like, wow, that's a, a very big similarity that I never thought of before doing it, but after I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Well, lawyers are, pr great lawyers, are problem solvers and communicators. Yes. They have to be both, including when you have to communicate in court when it's very by the book and by the rules and robotic, like you still have to be able to artfully find your way around that. So I think it's funny you say that. I think lawyers are really, that's, that's the type of job, the type of profession that depending on your personality type, that is a part of it, but you could go into that and you could almost not anything, but you could do a lot of things besides being a lawyer just by having that expertise. Like the amount of emotional intelligence things that you have to understand to do that job, that you fucking do anything, man. So maybe there is something to that. Maybe like, because I, I never wanted to be a lawyer. I knew that at a young age. But maybe like the way we litigate some things on the podcast, it's just like, for whatever reason, I was the guy who didn't want to look at some dude in a black robe and call him your honor. But, you know, we'll sit here on a podcast and say what the fuck is going on and maybe get somewhere. Different strokes, different folks, but maybe the same pool, you know? Yeah, and I heard what you did for that Raj podcast. Like, you were listening yeah. to hours and reading through hours and hours, and he's yeah. saying you know the case better than he does. And it's like, well, that's the same skill that your dad probably used. Yeah, my dad actually looked at some of the cases, too. While we were looking. Yeah, dude, that's a great example, 100%. Like, that, I think I've even used, I might have said it on your podcast, but, like, we litigated the case. Like, yeah. that's what we... We did, and I was saying there were some better ways I'd do that today. But that was an important podcast, and maybe that was a little part of it. It's like, all right, well, let's get to all the let's get to all the facts here, so no one can poke any holes in it. You know, hopefully we did that. But you know, you like what I do and what you do, and we were also talking about this a little bit earlier on the previous one we did on your show. But like, you know, we we go about it in different ways, but. I always appreciate how other people cook the meal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you're like the huge, I'm the guy who comes in here, throws on the camera and just gets someone talking and sees where we can go. You're the guy who digs into every single thing about people's lives and whatever. And it's interesting to me because in my previous career, while I did the former, I also did the latter, mm. right? Like I'd know about people before I went to met them. I'd find everything. So I think a part of me, like when I was watching how you did it, was like, oh, that's just like me in my career or whatever. But had you ever really like, you obviously had heroes who you looked into and knew a lot about, but had you ever done things in your life where you were really like having to do homework, like investigations almost on other people? before meeting them or was there anything applicable to that or, or how did that go down? I would just meet people and I would just stalk them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I got like that is what I do like naturally because I'm so curious about people, how they relate to other people, how they built their themselves up. And so I'll just find myself like going down rabbit holes of like, oh, I just met that person. Like what's going on with them? Like, and my dad will do the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. and I used to think that was weird, and maybe it is, but that's just your curiosity coming to the forefront using the tools that we've been given. And I'm just not, there's a couple of things going on. One, I'm really curious about people and like what they are doing with their time on earth. And two, I'm like, I want to know how all the pieces put together. And then the other thing is like, I want to come prepared. Like, I want that person to be like, oh, shit, I didn't even realize that about myself. Like, mm. wow, I do do that. Or wow, like, because a lot of the times, if I'm researching somebody and I'm learning about them, I know them better than they know themselves. <laughs> and that sounds funny and that sounds like crazy almost, but it's true. Like, how well do you know yourself from 2013 or 2016? Like, when was the last time you spent a thought with yourself from those years? Like, Have I you meditated on that, bro? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, yeah. it, it really is true. And it is, it's a, it's a remarkable thing to be be able to give people perspectives about themselves that they mm -hmm. forgot about. And I take a lot of pride in doing that. And I take a, pr a lot of pride in giving people new perspectives on themselves. So yeah, it's a, uh, I don't, 
I don't know, part of it's genetic, part of it's curiosity, part of it's like you learn to hone it. You know, Tim Ferriss does a lot of research and I always remember... He's got, yeah, he's amazing. I always remember like listening to that podcast being like, oh wow, I really appreciate that he looked out for the listener, me, in that moment by doing mm. a lot of research. I always felt like he really cared about me when he was telling somebody about themselves. So I took that as like a little wink of like, oh, you could gain from doing that. Do you enjoy getting surprised though when it's something that was unresearchable that someone brings up and you're like, whoa, like you, you do got to enjoy that, right? Uh, a thousand percent. Yeah. I mean like- So you get both. Yeah, I yeah. get both of it. Cause you could research someone 20 hours, 30 yeah. hours. There's no way you're going to come up with every story. Correct. And that's amazing. I love learning about the stories on the fly. I don't attempt to try to do every bit of research of every single thing that they've ever done because I want to be surprised too, you know? Like you have such authentic reactions to some of this stuff because how could you possibly yeah, know? I had no fucking idea. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, really? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there, there's that part of it too that you get as well. Yeah. But what's the, you know, I, I often look at guys like you who are sitting in the seat where you kind of get your own personal, like, up-close YouTube education. Or like college education and what you do. So what, like, have you uncovered, maybe not even like podcast related, but like within your life related skills about yourself that you learned about by hearing other people describe their own experiences to you? What do you mean? So based on sitting down with guests who are from all these walks of life doing all these different things, have you had eureka moments where they start going through an experience they had where they learned something and maybe learned how to do X something really well that then you're like, well, wait a second. I had something like that similar too. And maybe I could utilize that in the future by I'm making something up right yeah. now, but by, by using that to do some, or is it mostly like you're picking up a lot of new things from people and trying to then integrate it in your life, like the positive things? Yeah. I, it's funny. I don't think about it. Like I think, how I think about podcasting is that the good stuff will stick. And so I'm taking in and you're taking in so much information from people that it's like, I don't, what, whatever comes to the surface, like meditating, for example, is something that's stuck for me. And I was doing it before, but it's like, if it sticks, that's what it's all about, right? Like, I, I don't think about, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know what examples come to mind from from what you're talking about. I think sometimes, I mean, for me personally, I may hear like a musician talk and talk about music, which I love music, right? But in, and I speak from experience, this is a good example. Like when I talk with guys like Ashton Larald, when I talk with someone like Jufu early on, the ways that they're these guys are artists and they've had some success too. Like the ways that they relate to music and how notes play and things happen. Mm -hmm. Like in another universe, I'm doing that too. And I kind of, I never was in touch with that. And when they start speaking about it on here, I realize I fully understand their language. Mm -hmm. It's like we, it's like I can't read the music, but I can play the notes. You know what I mean? Like that's a little bit of a convoluted way of putting it, but. I have been able, like, from my seat to get in touch with other little things that maybe I'm decent at that I would have never given myself any credit for just based on how the other person is describing these things to me. It's kind of a meta thing to think about. But that to me is so cool because it's like mm. a self – like, I get something out of it because I'm like, wait, this person – Shit, this is like a shrink session. And they're not trying to do it. They're just telling me their experience. And now I'm like, oh, maybe – you know what? Maybe I'll – work with that and like i can tell you from experience on that one like that took my clips and my content i make to a whole new level because i started to get in touch with the fact that like i could feel it wow like i just it's there and i always thought everyone had that I, so i never recognized that i had it at all you understand yeah. like it's one of those things where you you don't you don't think like oh maybe my maybe there's one little thing my brain can process a little better than the average person you don't think at least i don't think like that ever but in speaking to other people, once they like, it's almost like they're telling me like, hey, you can be comfortable with thinking this if you're catching my drift right now. They're not telling me that, but they're insinuating that. And then I'm like, wait a minute. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the first 
wasn't like the first viral clip I ever did, but the most important clip I ever made from this, which I would do way better today, but it's beautiful to look back on like how it came together was with Ashton Larald with something he said in there. And like, I felt the notes, the music and what he was saying. Wow. That's really cool. Nothing like that has ever happened to me, but that is a, a fascinating thing. What, what about that? Like, like, did you know in that moment, like things were different? Yeah. Wow. Like, wait, in the moment of the podcast? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's crazy. Yes. It, I, I don't know, especially when people are like really good, when they're amazing communicators. Yeah. And I can just tell, like, I don't have to do a goddamn thing. I'm just sitting back here, just like letting them, letting them rip. And I, I just get to like, it's almost like you're sounding out the words in your head that they're saying because they're just using these beautiful images. And you know what? I don't want to like cheat, but in a way, it's got to be related to like meditation it's definitely not the same thing but that might be like my little early taste of meditation that's why i got to try this because you're more you know especially with the headphones in and everything we talked about that earlier but like you're more in touch with it and then god forbid you're editing it back and you get to hear it again and you're like whoa yeah and you still get that the hair on on your skin to stand up you're like oh that was real because that that was happening when it was happening and it's happening again and i knew it was coming yeah. You know, and, and, and I, I'll sit with that for a while and I'll be like, damn, like, why did it? I'll, I'll ask myself, like, why did that really vibe with me right there? Was it just a simple story or was, were they saying something else that I could relate to? What do you think goosebumps are? Ah, it's such a good question, man. I think, I, I don't want to sound like philosophical. I think goosebumps, I'm going to say this in the simplest, stupidest way possible. I think it's probably like nature's way of telling you something's different. It, something different is happening and not only is it okay, it's great. And it can be for different reasons. But you can get goosebumps out of fear. You can get goosebumps out of happiness. You can get goosebumps out of sadness you can get goosebumps out of catharsis you can get goosebumps out of nostalgia these are all very different emotions some of them are related but you know some of them are diametrically opposed but you can use them for all things to use fear as an example there fear is a gift my friend special agent jim diorio has always said that and that's mm. something he's dealt with doing crazy things in his life and i think about this a lot and when I hear other guests maybe not say those words, but they're saying it, pops in my head like it's a gift not because you should be this tough guy. It's like, oh, I'm not afraid of anything. You should be aware that you are human and there are things you fear and, and can you have the courage to stand in there and face it, right? So maybe if you get goosebumps from something like that, it's your body saying to yourself, are you going to you gonna stay? Are you going to go? Mm. You know, and how you use those goosebumps could be different. But then, you know, my favorite goosebumps are when it's like, it's some sort of emotional nostalgia, for sure. Yeah. Like, when I when I feel that, you know, and it can take you back to a different time in your life, and someone was so magical that they were able to say something to do that to you, that's like... Even, even, if it's, even if it's something they say that you didn't do, you can't relate to, but it reminds you of something, and you feel like you were there in their thing because of how they're describing it. That is the coolest, and I don't just say that because I'm a podcaster. I would challenge people listening right now to think about their conversations they have, and I'll bet there's a subset of people out there who feel the same way just sitting across from someone off camera having a conversation in their life when something like that happens, and they they feel that. I, I bet they would feel a similar way. I think it's truth. Mm. I think the reason why your hairs light up is because your body is recognizing truth. And uh, maybe a truth that you don't, you haven't looked at in a while, or it's giving you a new perspective for something. At least that's my, my take on it at this moment. That's perfect. I think that's exactly what it is. I might use that. <laughs> it's probably better. Are you, are you a, are you a religious guy? Not religious. Very spiritual. What does that mean? What do you mean by that? It means that I don't subscribe to... Christianity, Islam, Judaism, I don't, none of those like really resonate with me at a deep level, but I believe that there's truths in all of them. And I think the parts of it that are true, to me at least, is like love, 
they all mm. point to love in mm. some way. And I think listening is love. I think laughing is love. And I think that like really connecting with another human being that includes yourself, that's love as well. And so, yeah, I think that I'm, I'm not not religious, but I am spiritual. And I do have a heavy belief in like a God and whether that God is like within us or around us or what if we're all God ourselves? Like, What do you mean if we're all God ourselves? I think Peter Crone was quoting somebody when he said, you know, if someone was God and wanted to hide, what would be the best place to hide? Inside. <laughs> it's mm. like, if you really think about that and getting in touch with uh, with yourself, like if you really meditate, not that, you know, you think you're all powerful or anything like but like, we're all very powerful and we all like don't realize the extent of our power. And if you really sit with nothingness, like there is some energy that comes to the forefront. And so I don't know. I think there's a possibility that like there's God within all living things. Well, what do you think happens when we die? <laughs> do you really want to know? Yeah. Because no one, I guess, really knows. But... Yeah. No, I, I, I'm really interested in this topic. And I think Raymond Moody's got a great book worth checking out. Who's that? Um, Is he just an author or, or... He's a doctor. Got it. Um, but it, I think the book is around a bunch of different uh, people who have died and come back to life. So mm. they were physically pronounced dead. And it's remarkable like how similar the stories are yes. that people say. Like yes. a lot of them witness like being out of out of body that they could witness themselves from like the corner of the room. Um, yeah, I have no idea what happens, but I'm fascinated by it. And I think that, you know, if if you stumbled across an iPhone in the middle of a forest, you'd be like, this is pretty cool. Who created that? If you stumbled across a human, why would you think any differently? Human brain is more intelligent than an iPhone in many respects, in terms of what we can pick up and how we can communicate with each other. Like, are we really so naive to think that didn't come from anywhere? Well, one was there from the second we were born. And for at least a subset of the population right now, the other wasn't, yeah. right? For a large percentage of the population. The kids, it's going to be interesting, the kids who were born in the iPhone age, what they think of that. If that's like, if if you said, if I found an iPhone in the middle of the forest 20 years from now to like a 20-year-old, they'd be like, all right, it's a fucking iPhone. Right? Like, like that's just the way it is. To, yeah, we get, exactly. Yeah, even like chat GPT. I don't know if you've played around with it, but yes. like people are like, oh yeah, this is so obvious. This is so normal at this point. A lot of people say that right now. Doubts in the last year, right? We've already become used to it. And so we, we become so used to things and then we, one, they, when they lose their novelty, we stop asking questions about it. And mm. <laughs> really sit with that, right? When when it loses its novelty, we stop asking questions because it's like, oh, we already understand this thing. And so we believe naively that we we have humans, we have animals, we have we already understand it. But it's like, oh man, oh man. We probably haven't even started to even think about the questions that we should be asking it and asking ourselves. And we are so naive to the ways in which people operate. So, yeah, there was, you just reminded me of this. I had seen a clip on social media. This is recent, maybe like the last two months or something of Carl Sagan, who's now deceased, but I think it was from like the nineties. And he was talking about, I think the overall topic, the context was he was talking about the, waning interest in like math and science and things like that and he he related it to something perhaps like within our education like just as a whole like across at least america 
where he's like, if you talk to a five-year-old or a six-year-old, they ask you these meta questions about the world. Like, why are there trees? What's in the sky? Where are the stars? And, you know, we say these out loud and it's almost like, oh, it seems stupid. But then you're like, oh, no, like these are incredible questions. Like, why the fuck would you not? This is amazing. Why is a five-year-old asking this? And why is, why is the 25-year-old clocking into the nine to five? And he said some, when, when once they get to maybe it was high school or college, he's like, they're not asking these questions anymore. And he's like, something terrible has happened between kindergarten and whatever it was, college or, or 12th grade or something like that. And, you know, I, I don't know if that – like maybe – Maybe what he's in, what I thought he was insinuating there, at least, is a part of it. Maybe the like you, what was the word you just used? Novelty. Mm-hmm. We things become like a novelty or whatever. Maybe the way we are teaching things. I'm not just talking about math and science right now, but teaching the ways of our universe or the things around us in our environment. Maybe the way we're communicating that in schools and at home. Let's not just blame the schools. Let's blame fucking parents at home, like all of us, right? Maybe we are trying to cynically instill the novelty of reality into kids and we are then taking away their ability to consider what could be rather than what is. I don't know. That's something... I I don't know if I'm expressing that correctly, but that's... That's been on my mind a lot, and you're just reminding me of it now. Well, I think that we believe that we know so much, and maybe we do, but when you believe you know so much and it, and it leads you to stop asking questions, you've lost. And that's why I respect what you do so much is because it's all based on asking questions. The reason why you get chills when you say, when someone says something is because it's give you're getting a new perspective a lot of the time that is a new truth to you or a truth that you're reminded of. And it's because you're asking the question or the question is being asked. Whereas for a long time in school, I wasn't asking any questions. I didn't care. I was checked mm. out. And then I start asking the questions. I start getting chills again. You know, like, so because it's something about asking questions leads you to more answers, obviously, but you have to promote the ideas and promote asking questions if you want a better reality, a better society, a better world, from my perspective. See, I, like I laugh at that because it's it's like this obvious point, but you're spot on. Like this is why we've overcomplicated the world because a very simple idea like that is now, depending on the context, depending on what it is, is now ostracized. You know, people. You can go onto Twitter and watch people get yelled at for asking questions. Now, are there people who are just trying to stir shit up? Yes. I understand that. And when people are like, oh, go fuck yourself, I get it. But like sometimes like – I'm not just talking like politics and shit like that. I'm saying with like science or, or, or stuff, the whole point is supposed to be asking questions. I had Michu Kaku in here recently. Do you believe in God? Well, I believe in the God of Einstein. He believed in God, but not the God that intervenes in human affairs. It was the God of order the God of simplicity and elegance. Einstein was asked the question, did the universe have a choice? Is it unique? So universes, you can create universes in an afternoon, but most of them are unstable. Most of them fall apart. Most of them don't work. Our universe is stable. It works. Everything fits together. And then the question is, what set off the bang? That's what we do for a living. We have the Big Bang Theory up to the point where the universe is going to explode. Why did it explode? We think it was a quantum event. And we are here because we are in the universe which decided to explode. So Einstein said, was it all an accident? And he thought, no, it could not have been an accident. Obviously, the entire time he was here, he was talking about you know, all the different things that he's explored in his life. And even he's a guy who gets attacked for having string theory and not allowing people to ask questions. And he's like, what the fuck? I tell people, I tell everyone to fucking ask stuff, just come with evidence, right? But we're even at a point where our scientists are feeling like there's like these camps to say nothing of like us normal folk out there. And you're talking about, well, what does a question do? It gives you an answer. Fuck yeah. And maybe it doesn't give you the answer you want, or maybe it doesn't, maybe, maybe it leads to more questions. That's the whole fucking point of the universe. And yet people, people today, you know, that's why, that's why I do value the podcast community and like people doing it like you who, who are, who are actually trying to, to learn things. It almost feels like 
a part of that programming, perhaps, that Sagan was on to is that it's being beat into people not to learn things and just as fucking, here's what it is, eat your sandwich and get the fuck out of my face. Yeah. One thing that really helps me as well is just writing. Whenever I, I feel that way, like overwhelmed with thoughts, I just write out on the computer whatever comes to mind. Mm. And when I could see it, I'm like, oh, these thoughts aren't even that well formed. And like, look, the sentence structure is all off and like, oh, I can actually see it. But it's we can't criticize something unless it's on paper often or we have more awareness of it. Mm. And so that, that's that been a really helpful practice for me when I feel overwhelmed. And, you know, when you're doing this, there's so much that comes in your brain. And so if you don't have those coping mechanisms for how to get to a place of neutral, like you're just going to be taken with the wind. Yeah. Now you did, you had been saying you did like Andy Forsell's 75 hard, what, like four years ago, something like that? Yeah. 2019? Yeah. First of all, can you tell, for people who don't know, can you tell people who Andy is and, and what the 75 hard is? Yeah. So Andy Forsell had changed my life forever. He created this program called 75 hard, which for 75 days straight, you have to take a progress picture, do two workouts. One of them has to be outside, both 45 minutes, drink a gallon of water, eat a clean diet, and read 10 pages of a book, a nonfiction book. And you have to do that every day for 75 days straight, no days off. And if you miss a day or you forget a progress picture, you go back to day one. Mm. Um, Andy Frisella is also the creator of First Form, which is like a supplement company, huge company out of the Midwest. And you know, I got the chance to interview him and for episode 346 of the podcast. And I'm able to tell this man, sit him across from me and be like, yo, you changed my life. Like by doing this program, I did it once in September, 2019, around the exact same time I started meditating. And then I did it again in March of 2020. And so like, there were a lot of different moments where the program really helped me. And whenever I felt myself slipping, I was like, oh, like I can just come back to this program. And I mentioned meditation is one of the reasons why I my life changed like, and why the podcast is the way it is. 75 hard is as well. It's like, if you actually say you're going to do something and then you can do it and apply it to the podcast, what well, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, upload episodes. So yeah, it was a, a very pivotal, very pivotal program for me. I learned so much about myself and I learned like how my mind works. It was another form of meditation because I would feel myself being like, oh, I don't want to do this workout mm, and then do it anyway. To. And then just like it, it highlights the ways in which you are talking to yourself. If you don't have some sort of like setup of accountability, mm. at least in my experience, I find that that's where the, the slippages happen. Dude. You don't get things done. Me too. Like for that program, my friend Tej Dosa that I talked about before Every day I would text him and he would text me to say he was done with that day and I was done with that day as well. So like mm. that's just a little quick hack that people can use if they have a friend who's on the same page as them and who are trying to accomplish similar things. Just having that daily accountability of like, yo, I did my thing today that I said I was going to do. Like that one thing, not wanting to let him down was what for the first half of the program got me through it. Mm. So sometimes you can use other people's version of you as accountability or motivation to actually get it done because his vision of me was greater than my own vision of myself and then mm. you know at a certain point my vision of myself became greater because i look i'd done this for seven, 37 days so obviously i could get something done but you're you're pointing out another thing right there it's really important like who you surround yourself with you know one of the things like we get to talk to a lot of people on the podcast, which is great. And it sounds like you do a great job of staying in touch with them and constantly talking with people. I'd like to think I do a good job of that as well. But, you know, there's aspects of a job like this and there's other people listening right now who do different things that can certainly relate to this where you're you're on an island. You know, you're mm -hmm. kind of like, you're connecting with people for the job, thank God, but then you got to do the work behind the scenes. It's just you. You know, you're a one-man company. You know, like have an editor who works with you a little bit. I have some editors I work with on a remote basis as well. But like, you know, in building what you've done, because you've been doing it for over th three years now pretty much, like yeah. what do you ever, do you ever wish you 
you started like a company with other people that you could be in there grinding with? Or do you feel like the podcast is enough connection to be able to supplement that idea of like being surrounded by great people that are motivating you to be better at what you do? Yeah, I, I love working with the editor, my editor, Video King Pablo. We just go back and forth on text and like something good happens and I text him about it and it's awesome. Like it's a great um, accountability. But he doesn't sit with you, right? No. He's not physically with you. No, he's not That's physically. That's what I mean. Yeah. Um, I see a, a huge benefit to it. and But no part of me, every, every part of me knows that what I'm doing right now is the right thing for me to do. But I also see the benefits of like being in the office and building something with a team. Like that's sick too. So yeah, I mean, to each their own. And, you know, I'm sure in the future I will if I want to. Yeah, I could, def- I could definitely see you building something someday like i feel like a lot of people are there's two ways podcasts go people either start a podcast that then builds them the credibility to get into the things they want to get into or they already did those things now they want to share it or share their perspectives on a podcast in a qualified way obviously like you and i being younger guys it would more be the former than the latter but yeah like like when i was up i I really enjoyed meeting the whole crew up there in New York a couple months ago with Zach and, and Dylan and Hunter and, and, and those guys that, that were all up there with you. But like, I could kind of tell like there's, they're in the type of environment where ideas are always forming and like you love, it was so clear. Like you love that environment. I, I like observing this about people and it was like, uh, yeah, this guy will definitely like have, especially with all the people you talk to, you're going to have like some like really good idea or like be around the guys who have the right idea that you also fuck with one day. Like I predict you'll, you'll do something as well. Like on top of it, like you're the guy I feel like we'll do a podcast till the day you die, but also like you're going to have other things come out of that. I don't know if you're like, if you agree with that or if like you're in touch with that at all with yourself, but it certainly seems that way. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. I think it's, it's cool to be in the rooms where all of it happens, right? Mm-hmm. Like like people will bring up people to you and you're like, yeah, that's my boy. Or like, yeah, like, and it's like, we're both in doing the same thing and we're both around the same age, started around the same time that we're both like starting to feel the things that we've been doing and seeing how people are responding to it and seeing how how deeply we're connected, like, you'll introduce one guest to another guest and they're like, oh, wow, you're the connecting point for that. And now let's say like they go on to do business together. They make a lot of money. Like they're thanking you. And so that's already happened to me a few times where it's like I've connected people just out of the kindness of my own heart. And it's like led to opportunities for me where I'm like, wow, I didn't never could have foreseen this happening. But it's like just because you're the connector point, good things happen to the... And like that makes me think about like networks as a whole like you go on to twitter who has the value there the person who's creating the network of twitter so it's like in our own way we are both becoming our own networks and those networks then have power and so i think it's a really cool thing and to be at a center point of a network that is building and expanding it's exciting yeah it's cool i i had never thought it's stupid i'd never thought of that but as this went along some of my friends, like Chaz Servino, were early on telling me about this. Like, dude, like all these different people who come on, like you've connected a few of them, and like they can, they have you in common, like this show. I'm like, wow, that is pretty cool. It's like a nice organic thing to happen. But in order to do it, you also have to be like, you have to be like you. You have to be like invested in these people. You have to be genuinely like interested in what they're doing, genuinely interested in helping them, you know, perhaps also in the middle of like the hubs where this is like you're down in Austin. There's obviously a ton of guys who are in the types of categories you want, who are in that area or there all the time, you know, so you kind of become like a point of reference. But I mean, are are you friends with like people in the industry too? Like in podcasting? I know you've had some podcasters on your show, but yeah, I mean, some podcasters, I I don't know. I wouldn't say I'm like deeply in the industry. I don't know. Like, good for you. You know, I don't think about it like that. I just think about like I talk to who I'm interested in and who I think is cool, and yeah, let that guide me. And I think you're the same way. Like, just to have the ability of like, if I'm interested in this person, I'm gonna have them on. Right. Like, if you if you do anything else and you're like trying to be friends with people because you think it'll get you money, like, I don't know. To me, that I've never resonated with that energy. Yeah, that's the. It never works either. Even people that become successful off stuff like that, 
something goes wrong. Yeah. I don't know. That's just what I see. Like, you have to do things. You have to do things to add value for other people. And you know, that's how you get value for yourself, too. Yeah. And also the pure intent, like, comes yeah. across. Yep. Like, exactly. so often in life, in what I was doing with, like, drop shipping, it's like, it wasn't with pure intent. And hence, it didn't work out. And so the more things you can do with pure intent, the better. And it's like, I, I got to that place through meditation. You know, I can't say it enough. Keeps coming back. To Bro, I'm, I'm going to say it till the day I die. <laughs> like, because I think no matter how many times I say it, there's someone who hasn't heard it. And if I say it the 10th time or the 100th time or the 1,000th time, like, it's never going to hurt you to go inward. Well, what do you do besides setting up a good network and meditation, which are two key things you do, crucial things you do in your life? Like, what other things do you do that you think allow you to be as consistent and disciplined and growing as you are? You know, because as we said, you put out like three a week. You're at episode like 370 or something. You know, you, like obviously, especially with the people you've coming on and the type of product you put out, like it's really getting there for you. And it's it's only going to get way bigger. But what else outside of those two things in particular, what else do you think goes into it for you that is like your superpowers? Yeah, I mean, I think the exercise, like I wouldn't be who I am without the exercise component yeah. of it. You know, thank God for that kid shoving me into a locker, you know, <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> but it's like that that foundation of like, you can actually grow by doing consistent actions. Like that to me, that concept was novel before 12th grade. Like I didn't think that I could, like I was cut from the, the basketball team in seventh grade. And I was like, oh, I guess I suck at basketball. Like, I guess I can't improve. I guess that's it. So I, that was like the first time where I realized... Like the gym was like, oh, like if I put effort into this, like mm. shit will get bigger, shit will get better, and I can be better. And that's a, that to me is like such an obvious concept today. But I wouldn't like the first podcast that I did sucked, and like if I look back on them, I'm like, all right, like I knew that was bad at that time, but I knew I loved it, and I knew that it could get better if I kept doing it. And so I think that like exercise and and con the consistent exercise has been pivotal in helping me understand mentally like oh if you just continue doing something over a long period of time you have way different results see on the meditation topic i think exercise is actual meditation when you get deep enough into it not always not certainly i not every workout for sure but once in a while when i have a really really good workout especially like if i do a long lift first and then do cardio, mm. there's probably a few minutes in there that are on a wavelength of like some of the effect you get with the meditation. Like that's, you and I were talking about this early on the other podcast, but like that is, I don't think there's any life-saving drug in the world better than that. I couldn't agree more. I, I love hearing when people like you who are disciplined and, and, and put out like a great product and work hard and, and constantly keep getting after it consistently. I love when, when one of the key foundations I ask, like first thing is like, Oh, physical fitness, being in good shape. It's gotta be like, and if, if you're not like start with walking, you know, yeah. like just start with doing something to move your body. And I'm so grateful for it. Like the ability to move our body and do it consistently and to get better. Like I'm training for a marathon right now. And oh I'm, shit. Wow. And I'm just like, I've never run more than 13 miles, so half marathon, but like I, I'm i doing it for the first time again. You know, like when you do something and then you get decent at it and then you completely leave it to the side and then you have to restart again and you're like, all right, like this is what it is now. Like I suck now again. And that's part of it. And it's like, it's fun to come back to something that I used to love and enjoy doing and now do it again, so... What does that consist of? So when when are you running the marathon or planning to? December 2nd. And when did you start training for it? I mean, I started running consistently like six weeks ago. Okay. So, so, so all right. Doing like 20 miles a week at this point. So you have like four plus months yeah. left. So what, how do you, I, I don't know that I've ever really, I, like I've talked to people who are training for marathons before quickly, but I don't know if I've ever really gotten into exactly how it happens. What's the training schedule with that? Like, do you, are you just build adding like a set number distance per week on that you do like a certain number of days a week? Like, how does it work? Yeah, I think it's, so I hired a coach to help me run through it and it's like, you know, a hundred bucks a month. So 
very oh, it's great. affordable yeah. and yeah. it's like why not he just tells me what to do <laughs> what to run and i follow it and so i don't know too much of like what's going on and how much but i i assume what's happening is every week you have a, a set number of miles that you run and then the following week you add three miles or five miles and then you keep doing that until you know you get to be running a lot of miles a week and then it's a lot easier to run a marathon and then you actually by the end you you do a dry run pretty much right i like think you so do one that's like 26 yeah I, I assume so or at least 20 minutes i guess you're gonna find out i don't know <laughs> i haven't got to that point you know and and that's the thing of like trusting other people right like i could be like all right i'm gonna research all this on my own but i, I can i can now have the accountability of somebody else who i respect and also have him give me the what i believe is a great plan so then i'm like all right like this this works for me right and so i think that you know we got to take advantage of accountability as much as we humanly can with friends coaches mentors people because we're not meant to be on an island you know we're we're no. people who can who can only gain from being around other people and living up to the standards that they hold for us do you do you have anything like that for this podcast in what way like in the sense of accountability or like an external force other than the editors you have my friend danny jones who runs concrete podcast we talk almost every day yeah and he does he's in a similar lane he's a lot more successful than i am at this point but you know he's been at it longer he does an amazing job we cut the cake a different way but we do a similar type thing so we face a lot of the same issues a lot of the same problems so it's funny we were talking about that the other day like since we really became great friends we have without ever saying this out loud we've pushed each other wow so that's definitely i'd never i guess thought of it in that lens and then i was like oh duh like that's exactly what we're doing because we're constantly like all right who are you talking to ah what'd you get into what worked what didn't you know you're you're very we're both unbelievably self-critical of what we do which again we talked about that earlier that can go too far sometimes but I think for the most part, to be frank, I think we use it for the the right way. We're using it and then we're like, oh, so we can do it this way instead. And it becomes a positive rather than just focusing on the negative of what you did wrong. But yeah, I mean, that's that's been huge for me. The rest of it, though, no. I mean, I make my own. That's It's like a lot of, I don't know. It's a weird thing about the entrepreneur life. Like you make your own schedule. You make your own expectations. It's on you, but like if you do shit that doesn't work, well, it's on you then. So you better be doing something that works. And and that also means like you have to be willing to change things, which I've done a million times over as this goes. The one thing that stayed consistent is how I do the convos. That's always been the same because that's what it is. But maybe some style things that I do, I'll be like, oh. I do this a lot. I shouldn't do that. You know, like those things change just the way, you know what I mean? Like the overall meal kind of stays the same. But I do, like sometimes I get like, you know, like the panic in the middle of the night because I'm like, wait, am I delaying this because I'm trying to be perfect at this? Mm -hmm. And I'm not being accountable to the fact that I just got to have it? Or am I rushing this? And it needs to be better. Like, you know, things like that because you don't have there's no like all right julian youtube doesn't hit me up and say you're putting out an episode tomorrow at three hope you're ready i gotta say that yeah it's a weird thing no i mean you're in the same boat well having the schedule really helps me and you you kind of have a schedule and like kind of yeah you have like a loose schedule in your head I feel yes like. i do and i used to have a strict schedule and then the product changed and i was okay with that yeah because the edits got harder to do because it took more time it's more than that. It's it's not just that. It's like the expectations of the product went way up. And also artistically, a lot more happened exactly what you're saying. But yeah, that's, that's a little bit of a compli like it's a boring, complicated answer. But in essence, I do have a I do have a loose schedule and I do in a panicked way, keep myself towards that. I also don't force things though. For a long time, 
I forced it because I said, you have to put out the episode at three o'clock on this day. And then I got to a point where I'm like, no, because I always tell myself, well, is that just me trying to find a way out? Or is that me being honest? Like, no, that's stupid because it's not correct. You need to you need to be able to put it out on that day over there because it's not like you're not working this whole time. You're not like going on a vacation. I'm never doing that. So like I know as long as I'm working, I'm probably on the right path. So I give myself that, I don't know, leeway. But I'm still, I still am critical of that all the time. Like, oh, could I have gotten that done though? That's where the accountability comes in and you're like, oh, I wish, sometimes you wish you had like the boss over you. Like, no, it's got to be done. Yeah. You know? Well, how I look at the past is like, it happened that way and it couldn't have happened any other way because it didn't. Mm. And that's, it's like not arguing with reality, right? Is the most important thing for peace. And I think that, you know, we're, we can be critical of ourselves in the past, but like when that is coming at the expense of like, I shouldn't have done this because I, this, this, and this reason, it's like, that's just in the present us being upset. And so, yeah, I mean, I understand where you're coming from. You're you're incredibly self-critical of yourself, which has allowed you to create incredible works. And, you know, I think you've done that with a lot of harm to yourself in some way. And I think you can let go of a lot of that and still get an even better result. And I think part of you is like nervous to do that, but I'm here to tell you that you can do it. I appreciate hearing the reassurance because a part of me is nervous to do that, but I'm working towards doing that aggressively every day. And part of that is... Yeah, eventually I'm gonna hand off everything except recording the podcast. That's a little bit scary. Yeah. But so far, like if I could be proud of myself on something, everything I've handed off, I'm still hands on on like details, like little things. That's important. I'm okay with that. And it also keeps me, I'm busy. I love that, you know, especially when I'm chasing it right now and I'm still chasing it. So, you know, everything I've handed off though has worked out well. And the the people who have taken it and run with it, I mean, there's a couple examples where maybe that didn't work over the last couple of years. But overall, I mean, the stuff like right now, all the people who are helping out, even in very small ways, like they're doing a kick-ass job. So it's like the big thing is going to be when I hand off the main episodes. Because my main channel, no one has ever touched that. No one's even hit the enter button on anything. No one's hit the upload button. No one's done a comment there. No one's done a like from the account to another video, you know. And eventually, you know, I'm going to hand off how that happens. And I'm probably going to scale back what the over-the-topness of the wrapping of the product is now. You know, because I don't like having to create to create. I don't like it. I have to do it right now. It's part of paying your dues. When I no longer have to do that, I'm not gonna. You know, I have to do an intro every week and my OCD ass has to do it for 20, 25 hours to do it right. A year from now, I'm not fucking doing intros, assuming I've earned the right to not have to do them. Yeah. But if I want to do one sometime because I'm feeling the vibe, fuck yeah, I'm gonna sit down. Don't bother me. You know what I mean? Like there's a balance to it. But I truly believe you have to earn all of it. Like, I don't get to decide if the podcast is good. It's not my call. It's the, it's the people watching it. Do they watch it or don't they? You know? But, so, but, 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 but do you think that it's do you think that it's right to judge if it's good or not based on if people see it? No. I'm glad you asked that question. I'm talking overall. Not episode to episode. I've had some episodes that, like, you don't see the data, and even the data agrees with me that it's great, but it just didn't go anywhere. I'm not going to judge the episode because of that. That guy was fucking awesome, and maybe I did okay in it too. But yeah, I, yeah, it's a good question. I'm saying overall, if I were putting out a podcast every week and no one was watching it and it stayed that way for three years, it's probably either I'm not marketing it correctly or more likely I just suck. And that's it. The market is the arbiter of truth. It's not necessarily the arbiter of truth every week. Things get wrong. You know, things that should be right, like, don't always go that way. But you can't, you can't live week to week like that. And sometimes you fall into that trap and you're like, fuck, why didn't this work? And you just got to relax. So I just, I always tell myself, I I don't know if you have a similar experience, but I tell myself over time, the audience is going to make those decisions. And... 
I have to get to a point where the where they're saying to me on a mass scale, yes, Julian, whatever you put out, you've established enough faith that we think it's most likely going to be good. So we're going to give it the click and we're going to give it the time. I don't need to have a 90 second Oscar winning intro that took you 25 hours just to make me watch it, which right now, 75% of the people, they need that. I need to get that number down to 20%. Yeah. Well, it it makes sense. It makes sense, right? Like, why should anyone trust Julian Dory or Danny Miranda after two years or three years of putting out content? Like, come on. Like, like it takes a decade plus, is how I view it, of like consistency with somebody and making them more educated or or laugh or in some way like being a their presence for them to be like all right like you're like drake drops an album like people are going to fucking listen but like drake 10 years ago it's he's got to earn it earn the trust of the people because he's given them and built up so much goodwill over time and i think that we're in the process right now of those first three years and yeah it's fun this part is fun too like we're going to be looking back on this 10 years from now being like Yo, remember how clueless we were back in the day? <laughs> you can roll the tape on it, actually. <laughs> That's going to be crazy. And yeah. it's going to be really cool. But And it's it's rare. It's very rare when you have somebody who is at your level in terms of the amount of time that they've been doing it and the, the level of seriousness they take it. And to be able to watch that journey unfold. To me, yes. that's like the most precious thing. To me, that's more precious than the actual accomplishment of whatever it is we want to accomplish. To me, it's like the fact that I can call my mom and tell her like, yo, this just happened. Like that to me, that phone call is more important than the actual event itself. Mm. And and that's how I feel about connections and friendships and relationships like the one we have is like, that is more important than what, whatever it is we actually accomplish. So, yeah. No, I, I love it. I agree with you 100%. I love it. Like, you know, because now I kind of have that with you. That's why I wanted to reach out. I, I want more of that, right? Because when I started, I mean, for as great as my network was, as I was lucky to have coming into this, and I was very fortunate for just as luck would have it, one place where I did not have a network coverage was on podcasting. I knew nobody, literally nobody, like in the space, period. And so when I met Danny Jones, like I realized how cool that was to see, like have someone to look up to, someone who was working his ass off and 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 does an amazing job with the podcast that I could also pick up a lot of things from. Also even see mistakes and be like, oh, wait, oh, I can learn from that too, you know, because he's been at it longer than I have. Like Joe Rogan, we all have the example of all the mistakes he made. He's done way more great than mistakes but we have the example of all the mistakes he made as the guy who trailblazed like the whole way so as far as i'm concerned we don't have an excuse to make those mistakes you know it's like he's showing you the way and i don't know him i know danny jones i know you now i i wish i had that at the very beginning so i very much i very much i mean when i called you i was looking for it you know yeah it's hard to have that in the first year of any project because it's like those people there's a lot of people starting a podcast for a year. And so how do you differentiate the people who are going to take it seriously versus the per- people who are not? But the people who are two years in the game, you're like, all right, they they went through a year of, of no one giving a fuck. And so like they made it to their second year. Then they made it to their third year. It's like, all right, you can, at the end, like the score takes care of itself. Yes. And the people are supposed to be friends are going to be friends. And I don't know if you notice this with you, but it's like, I find myself like connecting a lot with people in other industries who have also been doing their thing for a similar amount of time. Like people Mm. who have built their YouTube channels for starting in 2020. I'm like, oh, wow, we're connecting at this point. Uh, Or people starting their companies in 2020. It's like, we'll magically come together in 2023. And so I'm curious if you've had that similar experience of like people at that time also coming together and seeing them. Not really. Yeah. Yeah. That's where you got great coverage. It's a great point. There's there's one guy who I won't say who I connected with recently is really cool who does a YouTube channel. He's got a huge YouTube channel and he's been at it. I think he's been at it about two and a half years, but he was doing a lot of shit before that that just wasn't on his channel. So he's been at it for a long, like he's really good. And I want more of that. You know, there's some other people I've been looking at that I'm like a fan of. I'm like, oh, I want to know that guy. I want to know what he does. I want to help him out too. Like if I can get more, if I can get my people who haven't seen his channel over there, let's do it. I mean, it's self-serving, but it's also, 
you know, you can, with these platforms we're building, we can do that. We can shine a light on people. You've done an amazing job of that. But I, I agree, man. You're, you're definitely farther along in that because of the nature of the types of guests you and have the amount. on. And the amount, for sure. But you do like a lot of content creators and stuff. I haven't had as much of that. I've had some, but not not a ton. I mean, the the subject matters are across the board. That's just one place like I want to dig into more. But the other thing is, I would imagine you've had a lot of guys on or at least some guys on who you know, maybe people looked at them as an overnight success or something and it never is. <laughs> never. Never. No. Like they were at it for fucking like nine years failing. And then suddenly like they went up and people were like, oh, look at this guy. You know, that almost like drives me nuts because I'm like, no, no, no. You got to give them credit for that. Like they they put they paid their dues, you know? Yeah. It's always that's that same story over and over and over and over and over again. Like the amount of times where I see that and it gets me excited to be in the process of building with other people around that time because the people that I'm talking to so often, I'm like, oh, in about six years, everybody's going to know this person. In about seven years, everyone's going to know. Like, I feel very much like I discovered Gary Vaynerchuk when I was 13 years old. Yeah, you know, so amazing. like I'm discovering a lot of people like you who the world will know about in seven years. Yeah, And that's like, that's a gift from God. I swear, like, you know, Chris Williamson, for example, he's got a million subscribers on YouTube pretty much. And, you know, I'm tweeting in January of 2021, yo, you guys got to follow Chris Williamson. In the next five years, he's going to be a household name. He's just about to hit 100,000 subscribers. So it's like, dude, I you knew. I yeah. just knew. You know, like, and it's cool. And so I don't know what to tell you. It's just like a mix of work ethic and discipline and people who are consistent and people who are obsessed with their craft. Like, people who are winners act like winners way before they're winners. And you, if you're really tapped in, if you're really looking for it, you can find it. And so I, I see that in you and I, I see that in oh, so you. many people I talk to. So it makes me excited because when those people inevitably win at huge scales, they're going to, you know, they might, some of those people might not forget that I had them on the podcast for a like- A lot ever. of them won't forget, bro. <laughs> yeah. A lot. Yeah. You're really good at that. But you've had on so many people and obviously, obviously I'm not telling you to say names here, but- <sighs> Do you ever find yourself sitting across from someone who you're having on that you've scouted as someone who you think could be next and you start talking with them and you realize, no, like maybe they don't want it bad enough. Mm. Maybe they're completely undisciplined and unapologetic about it. You know, do you ever, do you ever pick up on things where you're like, I think maybe that's not going to work out for this person? Yeah, of course. Like that, that's going to happen now if you get a closer look and a feel and that's part of it too. But like, and it also could just be like, I don't resonate with this person as much as I thought I would based on the work that they present online. Mm. Like that, that's a possibility as well. And too. that's more personal rather than than what their potential is. But that's interesting. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how when we meet or some someone you know meets somebody who's famous, the first question we always ask is? What were they like? Yeah. Isn't that so funny? Because I think we want to know you know, I'm not like the starstruck guy. That's not really a thing for me. But you see people a lot that there's a small part of you that feels like, oh, maybe you know a little bit. Like, I don't think I know him. I know some people do. But like, maybe you know a little bit about him. And then, especially if you like them, you want to know that that's what they really are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I Another the similar question is like, were they nice? Exactly. Yeah. It's like, we just want to know that the people who we were were seeing and we're, we're putting things on. Like, you've got such great images of famous people over here. It's like, we want to know, like, were those nice people? Were those kind mm. people? Were they really who they were portraying themselves as? And, uh, yeah, I mean, with Conor McGregor, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. People aren't perfect, too. Yeah. What was that? There's a story. <sighs> who was it? It was a Yankee. I think it was Joe DiMaggio. I hope I'm right about this. Please correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. But he ran, I think it was Joe DiMaggio. He ran out a ground ball that literally went like right to the first baseman. And this motherfucker like sprinted down the line. Like he was long out and like sprinted all the way through the bag. 
and I think it was a reporter asked him afterward after the game, like, yo, what? You were running like the world was ending, and you were out like a quarter of the way down the line. Why'd you do that? And he said, because I don't know if there's a kid sitting in the first row who came to his very first game today and has never seen me play. And if I decide to dog it one time, that's how they're gonna. That's the example they're gonna see, and they're gonna think that this Joe DiMaggio guy, who's supposed to be a good player, has paid money to pay for the, to play for this team that they love, just mails it in. So why should they ever work hard? He said something like that. Damn. And I was like. When I heard that story, my friend's dad, Rob Ibrahim, uh, told me that. And I was like, oh, wow. yeah, I think about that all the time. Like, in this moment, what are you going to be? I heard, I heard someone on, on Dua Lipa's podcast describing Harry Styles and how – because he's so beloved. Like, you know, it's not just like the women look at him as a sex symbol. Like, like he is one of those guys that he can do no wrong and, like – the fan girling and fanboying at him is like mostly fan girling, but it's like insane. And they, I forget who the guest was, but they were describing how when you are sitting with him, nothing else is going on. Could be in a dressing room, could be in the lobby at a coffee shop. He is staring you directly in, in your eyes and making you feel like you are the most important thing in the world. And I'm like, well, it's really cool to hear that he's really like that. And also, yeah, everyone should learn something from that. Yeah. I was just listening to a podcast, Founders Podcast, on it was Arnold Schwarzenegger's girlfriend writing a book about what he was like before he was Arnold. And the one thing she says is his presence, his ability in the room to make everyone feel loved and connected and make jokes with them. 15 years later, they break up, Arnold and the girlfriend, the girlfriend's mom, still invites <laughs> Arnold over for dinner. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, presence was probably one part of that. You know what else he does, though? What? You kind of pointed this out earlier with something else. He smiles a lot. Yeah. He laughs a lot. Yeah. At least from what I see, I don't know him. But right. he certainly seems to do that. I think that's, you know, we were talking about fitness as a drug. Laughter and smiling and presence, like you have that. You're a drug with that for sure. Like I can be having kind of like a, like a not as boring ass, like not as great kind of day, and like I'll just see some clip of you like smiling ear to ear at some guy I don't give a flying fuck about, and suddenly I'm like, I'm invested. He's into this. This is great. Like look at him. He's having a good time. And suddenly I'll get a little sweat. Like it's contagious, you know? Yeah. And I think, like it's all contagious. Like the bad mood is also contagious. Yes. And the apathetic feeling towards life is also contagious. Yeah. So if you are under the understanding that everything is contagious, why wouldn't you choose the most positive? Right? Like, it's not complicated. And the, a lot of the things I've said in this podcast are probably very, very simple and that you've heard before. One, I'm under the belief that we need to be reminded more than we actually need to know. Two. Wait, say that again? We need to be reminded more than we actually need to know. Like, you know everything. You know to be happy rather than be sad. But like, mm. if I say that, that is inching you a little bit towards being happy. I, I'm saying to meditate. You've probably heard before to meditate. But maybe the 17th time you heard it is the time that it actually like, you know what? This guy does seem a little bit more happy than the average person. You know, so like, I'm under the belief that we need to be reminded of things. And also like, just... There is a, a love for life that I want people to have themselves. And how do you have that love for life? You remove all the, the ways in which you are blocked. And so... Wait, you remove all the ways in which you are blocked? Yes. So like the kid pushing me into the locker okay. in, in 12th grade. Like there are a lot of those things for a lot of people. And it's not that difficult when it's just one kid pushing you into a locker. And that's the most traumatic thing that happened to you in your life. Right, but like, for a lot of people, it's getting pushed into a locker every day. Yeah. Right, and so I'm, my heart goes out for that, and I'm, I'm empathetic towards it, and I have no idea what that's like, but I, I do know like you can start to slowly but surely remove the layers of day one, day two, day three, and every day you go through a layer, you become happier, you yes. become more at peace. So I think life isn't so much about like becoming happy. It's about removing the blocks to then get to a greater level of peace and happiness as a result. And maybe you can be a spark 
for that for other people, which I think you certainly are. You're in a position to do that. Like, again, I'd highly recommend people listen to your podcast, the Dan Miranda podcast. It's very, very good. You have a real, you have, you have, it oozes of positivity. Like, it makes me feel better when I listen to it, which is, that that's a gift. And, like, people, that means if I'm doing it, because I'm doing it, like, also, like, analytically, because I love to listen to different podcasts and why people are great at what they do. Like, that means the person who's just passively listening, who's not a podcaster, like, that's happening, you know, this, the skin's standing up a little bit when they listen to you. But I mean, I don't, I don't think like, I don't think we have to let those 70,000 out of 120 negative thoughts win. I just think mathematically it's easy to let it on a daily basis. I mean, it's easy to let it happen. So you have to do exactly what you're saying. You have to find ways to repeat things like we talked about, it, you can have some motivational stuff that's like a little negative that pushes you to do positive. But I'm saying like on a on a on a mass scale, you have to say more things that put something good in into the atmosphere. It's like the butterfly effect. Your you know? life is what you think every day. Like your life is coming down to your thoughts about your reality. There there have been people who are have been in awful situations, but their minds have allowed them to be at peace. It's like it's crazy. Um, Edith Eva Eager. Are you familiar with her? Edith. What's her name? Edith Eva Eager. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Okay. What's her story? I believe she's a Holocaust survivor. And her mom told her when she, when they were going to the camps, her mom said to her, they can take everything from you, but they can't take your thoughts. And if you really think about that. Yes. Like, no one can take the thoughts in your own head yes. and the reality that you're living with. And Viktor Frankl is another great example of this. Man's Search for Meaning is a book I highly recommend. It's like... I've seen this woman. Yeah. I, this is awesome that you brought her up. Yeah. She's awesome. I mean, like, it's real. It's yes. really, really real. And I think we we often just live in the reality of our first thought, our first negative thought, without thinking, can I change this? Is this really the truth? Or is am I throwing a pity party for myself in this moment? And that's fine. Like, you can do that. Like, no shame in that. It's human. It's yeah. human, yeah. But it's like... Do you, you let can... it live and linger? Yeah. But you can also change it if you'd like. Yeah. You really can. So... Yeah. Do you remember the movie La Vita e Bella? No. Or is, it, is it just La Vita, La Vita Bella? It's a 1997 movie. Roberto Benigni was an Italian movie, but it won like a bunch of Oscars. And it's about a an Italian... Jewish family who's it's it's a it's not a real story but it's the symbolism's awesome it's about an Italian Jewish family who is put into a concentration camp and it's the mother the father and then the little boy who's like five four or five years old and the father doesn't want him to be sad about being in a concentration camp so he decides to try to change the reality to make it seem like it's all a game and they're going to win a prize if they stay positive and do certain things and you know it's heavy in that it's literally a concentration camp but i don't know it, i the no pun intended the beauty of that movie always touched me because that was like the ultimate act of love that the father was putting on his son to to try to shield him from something no child should ever, ever be anywhere near, no adult should ever be near it, to say the least, and make him have, like, build some core, like, almost anti-traumatic memories in the most traumatic of moments. And if that doesn't show you, I know it's a movie, I know some people will be cynical about it, but if that doesn't show you, like, at least a symbol of what you can do, I don't know what does. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what was it called? I think it's called La Vita Bella. La Vita Bella. I can't Bella. remember if there's an E in there, like La Vita e Bella, but I think it's La Vita Bella. But yeah, you got to check that out. And I, you're you're a huge Tim Ferriss guy, you were saying, right? Yeah. Am I fucked up if I remember that he was the guy at the suicide story? Yeah. That's him. Can yeah. you tell people that story? Yeah. Um, I know that he, <sighs> dude, I mean, this is, this is deep. He was going to... Um, he was in college and he was having a tough time and I believe he goes to to check out some books from the library about how to commit suicide the right way. And he, when he goes to check them out, 
they send the letter to his home address at his house. And his home address is connected to where he lives on Long Island, not his Princeton address. His parents received the letter that he checked out this book from the library, open it, and call him on the spot. And that's the reason why he didn't commit suicide. Mm. It's like, whoa, that's that's crazy. And more recently, Tim has come out with a podcast about how he was abused sexually when he was very young, like under 5'10". And if you connect the dots, it's like, that is... And it's like, you have to think that a huge part of that reality that he was living in in college was because he hadn't considered what was going on when he was 5'10", or couldn't, you know, in any way. How did he say he came out of it, other than, you know, being saved at that one moment because it got recognized, but how did he say he mentally recharged himself with that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure past that, um, what happened exactly. Is he such a positive guy? I mean, he's like an inspiration for a lot of people. It's so crazy you think of him as positive because he would call himself depressed. Mm. And he would say like he struggled for a long time and might still to this day with depressive thoughts. And it's one of the reasons why he was thinking that he would not want to have children Mm. was because of the depressive thoughts that he had. And he's like, I don't want to pass this on. And that's actually one thing I was thinking about recently is like, you know, the Buddha said life is suffering. And if you really believe that to be true, like bring in children to a world that is suffering, what does that mean exactly? Mm. And like, I want to have children, I want, you know, like, yeah, I, and I'm like, too. but that thought, you know, that idea kind of threw me for a loop when I started playing that in my head. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. Like, why would you want to bring in children to suffering? But then I was like, I don't view this as suffering. I view this as an amazing reality. And I believe I can help create amazing realities for children, even if there's some suffering involved sure, in that. Sure, it's human. It, help, it helps make you... That, but that's a perfect example, how to reset that. Yes. You can look at all the negative of what happens in the world. And there's a lot of scary things that you know we deal with now, especially with how interrelated we are with technology and stuff. That's a whole separate topic. But like, that doesn't mean you have to look at it like they can't win if they come into this world. Like what... What kind of, why not say like it's a one in, what is it, a one in 10 trillion chance you're even born? Like it's literally winning more, the lottery a hundred times over. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, and some people are born with things that other people then, you know, aren't born with something as good, but like we all can add something to it. It's a beautiful thing. Like I would want to, I look forward to having kids, you yeah. know, and I know there's going to be fucked up shit that as a parent, I'm going to be like, God damn it. Why do we got to deal with this? I'll cross that bridge when we get to it. You know, I'm going to be a fucking dad. That'll be like the greatest thing ever. And my kids, hopefully they'll think I'm good. Right. You know, like why, why can't we look at it that way? Yes. You know, we don't know. You don't know when the end of the world's going to be or something. When that happens, we're all fucked. So who cares? Yes. You know, you can't, there's just certain things. It's like, you gotta, our job is to live life, try to chase happiness, procreate so that other people can do it too. Yeah. Why not? There's nothing to chase also with happiness. Yeah. You know, and it's funny. I don't, maybe this is like where the little photographic memory in here like mixes up the chapters, but I'm glad you told the Tim Ferriss story and it came up naturally because that's not, I'm obviously thinking of someone else, mm. but it involved books. And I wanted to bring it up because you're, what you've been saying is a great example of it. But the gist of it is, I guess it wasn't Tim, but it was someone else. I wish I knew if someone in the comments knows who this is, please comment it. But there was a guy who checked out books from a library. I don't know if it was like how to kill yourself or something, but he had checked out books from the library or was carrying books home from school, something like that. And they all fell down on the way home and he had been bullied and he had been going home to kill himself that day. And one kid stopped to help him pick them all up. Like they went all over the mud or some shit and then walked home with them and became his best friend and so this person i don't know how many years it was later this person maybe 10 years later was speaking at an auditorium for some event or accepting an award at some event and his friend was there and he had never told anyone he was going home to kill himself that night but he told the story and the friend that little act of probably very little thought, just like, oh, this kid dropped his books, let me help him out. And then just starting to talk with him and just, again, recognizing, being present, recognizing that he's there. Save that dude's life. Yeah, man. And that is like, 
even with people you don't know. Small things like maybe when I'm when I'm I'm the guy watching a clip of yours and getting a smile on my face, maybe someone else is doing it and like it's the littlest thing and it maybe they weren't gonna kill themselves, but like, you know, they're down a bad path and then suddenly like, you know, they DM you and they say, Danny, I love the show, I love what you're doing, like it's awesome and then they get something out of it, they start a business, they live a happy life. Like, like you could do that. That's that's a that's a beautiful thing. I hope you think about that with the type of content you do. Yeah. No, I appreciate you saying that. I think it's it's a remarkable thing that we all have got the power of the internet to interconnect. And it's like, that's a huge power. And it's like, when a, a baby is born, where we look at it and we're like, oh my God, this is an amazing thing. Like, this is so such a beautiful creation. And in some place, we lose it. We lose that sense of wonder and joy and awe of what that little baby yeah. was one day. It's so sad, man, that that we, because it's not novel anymore, we all of a sudden stop asking questions for it and start looking at it with almost apathy. Ah, oh, whatever. It's just a 25-year-old kid. Ah, oh, whatever. It's just a 45-year-old middle manager. That 45 middle manager was once a baby yeah. who was looked at with awe and wonder and appreciation and excitement and love and it's so sad that sometimes we refuse to look at ourselves the same way we would look at a baby. It's a great point, man. I don't have anything to add to that. I think that's, yeah, I, I just, when you say things like that, all I can say is like, I think of my own shortcomings sometimes when I'm having, uh, you know, a long day, I'm shorter on patience. It's like, well, who are you talking to when you do that? And, like, honestly, like, my mom will laugh listening to that if she actually listens to this episode. But, like, you know, a lot of times, like, she'll get the brunt of it because she's the closest one here. And I feel bad about that. I've told her that, too. And, like, sometimes she gets pissed off about that. But, like, maybe I wake up and I'm sick. And I'm just like, please don't talk to me. And then she's not doing anything wrong. But she talks to me. And I'm like, please stop. <laughs> you know, like, that. that's... That's a constant little regret that I try to improve over time. And it's not just with her. It's with other people sometimes too. And usually I'm good. Like the majority of the time, like I'm, I'm good with people obviously. But you want to make everyone feel like Harry Styles makes people feel apparently. Like they're totally – he is totally focused on them and, and, and wants them to, to, you know, feel totally heard. And that's, you know, that's – it's the nature of basic communication, is it not? Well, that short temper, that short, you know, fuse, and I appreciate you saying that, that comes from some place yes. in, in two different ways. In one way, it's like it's coming from your lack of patience for yourself, and it's also coming from your relationship with your mother in some way. And it's like, because you wouldn't, if I tried to talk to you in that same way, in that same day, you wouldn't be like, stop talking to me. You, <laughs> you sure about that? <laughs> you, you'd have a different response. Or, you know, like, so like, it's interesting how different people we talk to in different ways yes. and how that, it, it is an impact of how you're feeling about yourself, but it's also an impact of what that relationship is and what you're taking for granted in that moment or like what you're upset at in that moment. Oh my, I wish my mom didn't do this instead of that. And I wish, you know, when I was younger, she helped me in this way instead of that. So like, that's all going on in that moment. And um, yeah, the better we can get at a, being aware of that or the reasons why that came to be, the better we can get at actually treating others with more love, empathy, kindness, and the quote unquote right way that doesn't leave us later on feeling regret that we actually did. Well, you were talking earlier about your dad and sometimes having like, you know, a little contentious relationship with over some bullshit or something like totally. that. Totally. And you said like meditation is obviously a huge help with that. So that's like the core of what gets you through it. But do you find that like when you're meditating on that specific thing, when it then improves afterwards as a result of that, it's because you stop and you would kind of explain this earlier. I just want to make sure I heard this right and everything, but it's because not only do you remove like the worry about the things he's saying, but perhaps you take, even if it's not all your fault, you take responsibility and just alleviate it from him so that you can look inward on fixing your end of it to try to make it better. That's exactly right. And I'll tell you one more thing that I do that really has helped me out in this area is looking at my dad and anyone I'm having an issue with 
as that little kid that I was talking about before. Not as the baby, but as like, this is the seven-year-old or eight-year-old who needed love in that moment who didn't get it. And so how would I treat a seven or eight-year-old who's not getting love? I wouldn't scream at them. I don't know. I'd give them a hug or I, I'd I'd listen to them more. I'd be like, you know, that's that's all good that you think that. This is what I believe. But like, I see where you're coming from. Why would you try to scream at a seven-year-old? All we are is that little seven-year-old kid in a in a few more years. That That's all we are. And so I think having that top of mind, knowing that we are, are all that seven, eight-year-old boy or girl is just such a helpful way to go and look at the world because it gives the people you interact with more compassion because you would never scream at a seven or eight-year-old. You would never be passive aggressive to a seven or eight-year-old. I don't think I would. <laughs> <laughs> you would just hold them with love and empathy. Yes. And, and so I think that's been a huge help to my relationship with my dad, but also to just people who I have problems with in my day-to-day, -day, which is very few. Well, if there's one thing to take away today, it's that I got I to gotta get as good at meditation as you are. For sure, I, I, I think it's a, I think it's a great, like I've never heard a bad argument against it. Yeah, so, you know, I I should do that for and, sure. And it, the thing is, also, I don't view myself as good at meditation. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think like it's it's just I've been doing it for a lot of time. You know, three four years on and off, and I've noticed that the times that I've been doing it, my life has flowed better with the way life flows, and I've been mm -hmm. less resistant to the way life is unfolding. And so, yeah, I think that, you know, for anyone starting, it's just like 20 minutes in the morning, doing it for 90 days, not judging the results until the 90 days are complete. Don't tell me that it doesn't work and you do it, you know, every other day for, you know, a few weeks. And then yeah. you're like, you know, like, and a lot of people do that. And I respect that. And I, I, everyone has that phase. I did it with the gym, but it's like, that's not going to get you what you actually want. Yeah, you don't respect it. I mean, I, no, I, 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 I would... <laughs> I'd call myself out on shit like that. I'm not even talking about other people. I wouldn't respect that about myself when mm. I've done shit like that. Like, why is your podcast working? Because you stuck with it. Yeah. Why is mine hopefully working? Because I stuck with it. Commitment right? equals love. Yes. So, like, no, I, 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 I think you don't want to, you don't want to reaffirm that. I, 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 I think, think, I think it's showing that you are your head is in the right direction and it's important to give yourself love for that. If you go to the gym and you're inconsistent in the gym, how dare you go to the gym for a little bit and not be... No, you were showing an effort for yourself. I do respect that. Even if you're not consistent, that's I do fair. respect it. And But if you stop... Yes, I, I respect that that's where your level of consciousness is at that moment. And so... Even if you stop. Yes, I, I do respect it. I really do. Like you, you respect can't be perfect. Might be the wrong word. Yeah, yeah. I, respect might be the wrong. I word. see what you're saying. I, I, I know what you mean. You don't want to like tear people down and shit. I agree with that. Because but, like, there should be like a challenge. Like, well, why'd you do that? Let's let's talk about that. Like, especially if it's someone I care about. You know. Yeah. You know, like if I know someone I care about has gone through a struggle and now they're like really overweight or whatever and they're unhappy and like they start going to the gym and then they stop. I'm not gonna be like, hey, fatty, fucking going. I'm not. Do That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying like. Hey, why are you... All right, let's talk about this. Weren't you feeling like a little better, like a little more energy when you went there? How can we set up a plan? Maybe you tried to do too much at, at the start. How can we set up a plan to do it two times a week instead of fucking five? Yeah. Right? Like, that's what I mean. I wouldn't just sit there and be like, you know what? I respect where you're at. I'd want to try to help, not from from a place of love, not from not from a place of tearing people down. I, I, don't, I, I don't like doing that. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. and And you're right. Holding people to a high standard is amazing and like we should definitely do that and it's like if you have the thought of meditating and then you actually do it and then you don't you're not consistent with it th I'm, what i'm trying to say is that's okay like okay. it's all right you had that you what you need to is is to apply some external accountability mm. and or like join some group where your identity is going to help get formed in that way whether, whether that's like a meditation group or like you start, um, you join a church, right? Like there, sure. there are ways for your identity to become more spiritual. And I think like play to the way in which we are naturally going to want to do things, which is when we're a part of a group, we're going to want to do things. So uh, yeah, it's similar to going to the gym. Once you go to the gym enough times and people recognize you as somebody who goes to the gym, it's harder to stop going to the gym because enough people recognize you as that person. Yes. So it's harder with spiritual things. 
people could say, oh, Danny, you l- seem a little more happier. Dan- Danny, you sure. seem more peaceful, right? Like that, that, those are ways in which the spirituality comes as part of my identity. But that's only, that's only happened like, you know, after a couple of years of meditation. So I wouldn't... Well, I well wouldn't. whatever you're doing, it's working, man. Like I, I really, I, I mean this sincerely, like talking with you, I guess we've been talking for like five hours or something considering <laughs> the two podcasts. I've learned a ton today. I've learned a ton talking with you on the phone over the past several months as well. But, you know, you're a really positive guy. You're doing an amazing job with the podcast as well. It's nice to have a peer in the industry who's like doing their damn thing. But I really appreciate you. As I say to, I feel like so many people in here, because it is true, I really appreciate you getting deep and opening up and, and going through this. I know you're used to be on the other side of it, but... You know, it's it's an interesting thing to to start sharing. And like I said about all the other people I said about you, I don't take that for granted. So, where can people find the podcast, the Danny Miranda podcast? Spotify, Apple, YouTube, three best places to find the podcast, but available everywhere. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm taking notes from what you're doing and, and appreciate everything you're doing because you're Thanks pushing so. it forward. And you having me in here, it means a lot. And I respect the hell out of your show and respect Thank what you. you've built. It's remarkable. One man in a studio by himself, like, dude, hats off to you. Thank Keep you. the hat on, actually, if you don't want to get recognized. <laughs> <laughs> but I forgot it for a couple episodes. So <laughs> now people are like, you know, there were, it used to be like when I didn't wear it for intros and stuff, people were like, put the fucking hat on. <laughs> I, I got it less, so maybe we'll we'll not wear it sometimes, but we'll see. I, I'm but, so excited to see what you continue to build, and I'm so excited to see the CIA agents, the FBI agents, the Navy <laughs> SEALs, the UFO the agents. <laughs> like, it is crazy. The people you have and had on this chair, like, way smarter than me, but I'm just grateful that I can share this spot in the, the episodes with, with them. So thank hey, you so much. Dude, my pleasure, and, and everyone brings their own thing to the table. You brought a lot today, so I, I appreciate it, and... I want to. You've been you've been great on Spotify and everything, but I also want to see people give you the right love on YouTube as well. So let's get that the, let's get that thing up there. So people out there, if you haven't subscribed, I'll put the link in the description to the show. There's fucking 370 episodes to choose from, so you got a little bit of everything in there. So go check it out. You will enjoy it. And Danny, I look forward to talking more moving forward and and having you on the podcast again, brother. Hell yeah, this was a lot of fun. All right, everybody else, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace.